Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Romola D of Romola D Reports. I'm here this morning again with Techno Crime Fighters Forum. I'm here this morning with NSC whistleblower Karen Stewart. Unfortunately, we're not going to be joined by Dr. Millicent Black just yet, uh, but she may join us a little bit later. And I'm not entirely certain if Dr. Catherine Horton can join us this morning. She might surprise us. Um, so, good morning, everyone, and once again. Um, Maybe I should just sort of uh, lay out our regular spiel about what um, Techno Crime Fighters Forum is all about. We're a group of human rights advocates, whistleblowers, scientists, writers, journalists who are working together to speak openly about some of the incredible surveillance views that our country, the U.S., is currently facing and countries in, the U in Europe and in other parts of the world, including Australia, countries in Asia, countries in um, not other countries in North America and South America and Africa as well. So um, we're living in a time period where unfortunately uh, militaries and intelligence agencies have developed and are currently using anti-personnel electromagnetic technologies on civilian populaces, but not acknowledging them. Every now and then, as we see uh, in mainstream media, some kind of report floats up of uh, U.S. diplomats usually being assaulted with uh, electromagnetic weapons in far off places like Cuba and China. But there is no mention uh, by U.S. corporate media of assaults on U.S. soil against US citizens with this technology. And that is the kind of um, you know reportage that we are doing. We are bringing to the fore the reports, the many reports um, of people from around this country and around the world about the assault of these technologies on their person. So that being said, um, good morning, Karen. I guess we, I should say one of our- Good morning. One of our prevailing interests this morning is to talk about government actions and inactions and how we as citizens can query and challenge and protest those inactions and actions. So Karen, if you wanted to start and talk about this whole concept of you know doing the FOIA requests and um, how useful it is, because as we know, as most of us know who do FOIA requests, very often we get, uh, you know, we get stonewalled. So how can we use this process? To what extent is it useful? Um, and how, it, you know, what, what should we do within this situation? Well, I always suggest, suggest to people that they go ahead and, and uh, do a FOIA. And whether it's a local one, uh, like in Florida, it's called the Florida Sunshine Act. Um, whether you get an actual tidbit that's useful or whether you get rebuffed or obfuscation, they're both useful. So if you write and you ask everything that you should, morning, Catherine, um, and then you get a response back to them that is weasel worded or just obfuscating, you do still have proof that you did everything the government asked you to in regard to a Freedom of Information Act. You followed what they told you to do, but then they blocked you getting the information. So that's proof of duplicity on their part, you know, to give you a, an avenue that they know will not work or they make sure that it doesn't work. Now, having said that, there are FOIAs that have gotten people bits and pieces of very good information. So um, I was going to go a little bit into Florida, but Catherine, would you like to say something first? Okay. All righty. Um, I'll, I'll just basically go back to the situation in Florida where I had been fired from uh, NSA in 2010 and I began going to Florida for six or seven months every year waiting for my husband to finish up his, uh, his job and, and retire. And uh, at some point in Florida, early 2015 or so, I received a uh, response from a FOIA that I'd written, I believe, in 2013 to the De Department of Justice. And in early 2015, not real timely, uh, I got a response back saying, you know, in regard to your quest as to whether you've been uh, investigated or being investigated for something, we have no derogatory information on you whatsoever. That's early 2015. Well, just a little bit later into uh, probably about March or so of 2015, there I was being stalked and harassed right after getting this FOIA from the Department of Justice saying, we don't have a problem with you. Well, apparently somebody had a problem with me. And it turned out to be the um, 
um, basically uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, all, all, also known as um, the Fusion Center. So what had happened, to reiterate, is that my lawyer had subpoenaed something that NSA didn't like, and they panicked and uh, sent personnel, according to the Sheriff's Department, you know, to, uh, to Florida to tell them what a terrible threat to the country I was and how the um, Tallahassee people had to stalk and harass me because I was such a, such a threat. And uh, that was according to uh, Jeffrey Cannon, who admitted to me and bragged that the National Security Agency had come down to Florida for a secret exercise, along with the Miami uh, FBI. And um, so that was the beginning of all this stalking harassment. Now, when I figured out there was absolutely a Florida um, Sheriff's Department connection to the um, NSA and FBI stalking harassment of the InfraGuard, then I sent them what is called a Florida Freedom of Information Act. And it was very thorough. And uh, they responded that it would take them a while to figure out, you know, uh, how much immaterial they had uh, in regard to me, NSA, and the Florida Sheriff's Department. And they responded finally saying they probably had about 800 pages to go through to look for the information I wanted. And that would be about fifteen to $1,800 so uh, that was absolutely outrageous and impossible and i appealed it and basically got rebuffed and so the second inquiry i made they uh, had upped it to oh never mind we think it'll probably be nearer to two thousand dollars so that was absolutely impossible so what ramal and i were talking about before the podcast started was that the government is trying to keep the facade of people having the usual rights without actually allowing them to. So, you know, charging you astronomical and unbelievable fees for something is one way that they keep people from being able to actually do so. Another way I'd read about was that some local authorities are actually suing people for daring to ask for freedom of information requests, which uh, makes no sense, you know, on what basis are they suing? But I had said that this goes to what I had noticed in uh, Maryland when the last few months that I was employed, NSA had my neighbors go into my mailbox and steal my mail. And then I would get mail uh, back in the box after I'd actually picked it up for that day. And there shouldn't have been any in it. And the mail would be uh, opened or it would be so delayed that uh, some credit card bills were coming after they were due. And I think that never happens. But uh, one interesting thing was that I would send away FOIAs and not only not get a response, but I would not get the return receipts. So that meant uh, U.S. Postal Service complicity. Okay. So, and I also noticed at one point that I, I changed the mailbox key and then I hid out and uh, waited to see who would come to my box because it was one of those multiple box complexes and um, saw one of the neighbors. I mean, there were multiple neighbors who I caught and uh, some of them didn't even live on the street and it wasn't their box. So that was pretty obvious. And also something else that was rather suspicious to anybody would be somebody who gets driven to the box, goes, opens it, takes your mail, jumps in a car and speeds away, speeds out of, the, <laughs> out of the neighborhood. And especially if they have out of state license plates. So <laughs> how long distance do you go to get your mail? But <laughs> so it was just, it was ridiculously obvious. And uh, I was um, somewhat amused, even though this is rather obscene, but somewhat amused that um, one of the neighbors on the street in uh, Columbia, Maryland, uh, was a postal worker and he was more than happy to use his master key to go into my mailbox and take my mail and uh, have somebody examine it and then put it back. So the government is basically doing this big thing where they say, oh, of course you have a Freedom of Information Act that'll tell you anything you need to know. We're open and honest and no, you're not. You know, they're employing thugs to steal your mail to make sure you don't get your FOIA requests or to make sure they don't get there. And, um, and in Florida, again, uh, I had sent a uh, freedom of information request to the Jacksonville FBI and to the uh, Washington FBI and never got return receipts. So they're impeding it at every, 
at every juncture, they're impeding it. So this is obscene. And well, I was going to say that people have told me, yes, but I sent off this FOIA and I've gotten nothing. I didn't even get the receipt. And what do I do? I said, then you go to the postal inspector and you demand to know where that package is. And if they won't tell you, that also shows they're complicit. But I would resend it and put them on notice that you're resending it and you are doing it return receipt and you want it tracked. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. don't get discouraged. They count on 90% of the people being discouraged and not trying again. So be in their face and send it again. That's it, exactly. Absolutely, Karen. I just had to interject with my little story there yes. of my letters. Send first class mail. Okay, now you see, I did the things that I, I didn't do the things the way I should have done. I didn't go and certify it. I didn't register it. I did, you know, just a normal envelope. I stuck a first class mail stamp on it. And I went, walked down to the local post box and I stuck um, a letter in. And this was a FOIA request to the CIA. The first year that I was targeted, Okay, and because I take the dog out for walks, uh, you know, despite the weather all the time, or at least I used to, I need to get back to that. Um, but what happened was I walked past that post box again one day and I saw my letter to the CIA lying in the snow just outside that post box. Now, you see, the mailman had come to clear the mail from that post box, you know, with his big whatever. Um, his uh, basket or whatever, and he had just misplaced my letter. It was only my letter to the CIA that had fallen in the snow. Nobody else's letter to anybody else, but my letter to the CIA was in the snow. So I picked that up and, you know, I sent them off a letter again. Um, but the, another time I found my letter to the FBI was um, dropped you know, I had stuck the letter in my mailbox, you know, sticking out so the mailman can pick it up on his way out. But he had dropped it as if on the steps as he had walked down the porch steps. So again, my letter to the FBI dropped by the mailman. You know, I'm sorry, but that's called complicity in mailmen. These mailmen, as we know, you know, the USPS is a favorite haunt of the CIA, much as the mainstream media is. So, um, you know, that I just wanted to tell that little story. So your letter could be lost. It's probably much smarter to do, as Karen says, to go and put those letters in certified or in some way recorded by the post office so that you have some kind of tracking, you know, associated with it and you can get on the case. Actually, on the on the topic of, um, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I'm late. I drove back. I had to flee Hungary back to Zurich. <laughs> so today, it took me two days to come back here. I stayed two nights um, because I was shot in the head so much I couldn't actually make it on the road. Um, and then um, that was Hungary. <laughs> okay, just getting to the border was so intense. I actually stayed next to the border in Hungary because I couldn't make it. I was machine gunned at night and then I next day I thought, right, I'm going to, you know, get through Austria, the home of Hitler as quickly as possible. And lo and behold, in, in Austria, it was perfect calm. I can't say I recovered, but I almost recovered on the road and I didn't understand what was going on. Um, I think they pulsed me nonstop, but nobody actually shot me in the head. So that's that's the news. And then I uh, drove through Austria yesterday and I drove into Germany. And as soon as I crossed the border, I, it was like going into a hellfire missile assault, you know. And I was like, OK, I drove down the motorway back to Austria and I thought I'm staying one more night before I cross through Bavaria the home of the Nazi Bundesnachrichtendienst and I was for the better. So today I was late, but on the, on the topic, I've got so much to tell you and really good news as well on Austria. But on, on the topic of post, I also experienced that I ordered um, a bunch of books on the CIA and intel agencies like the Bundesnachrichtendienst and their crimes over Amazon and the package that I think the first package to arrive about the crimes of the Bundesnachrichtendienst, I think, or whichever, maybe it was the program killers by the CIA, one of these really, you know, bombshell books. Um, the Amazon package was left on my steps and it was ripped open demonstratively. And they do do that. So um, another one, I think that was the book by um, on the BND crimes, the German Intel crimes. There, the uh, the people sending it had put a stamp on the um, envelope saying, oh, yes, you're free to open it. You know, I was like, sorry, the postal secrecy still applies. Nobody's free to open it. And one side can't just unilaterally, you know, make my post uh, open to everybody. 
Um, so what, one of the things I recommend in both cases is you photograph it. If, you know, so many let people get exactly the same. As soon as you're walking into a situation where something odd happens, film it, photograph it. Ideally, you, you photograph it and you film it because a photograph goes really neatly into a court bundle because it's very little data. You can copy and paste it, drop and, drag and drop it in. But a video testimony on the spot where you're actually filming something and talking is really powerful because, you know, stuff will evolve, stuff will happen. And then months later, or years later, you can go back to the evidence and say, look, I said that back in the day, back at the time, you know. So that is super important that every single time something like that happens, you don't just think, oh, happened again, but you think great evidence, you know. And then with these postmen, get their names you know, run after them and say, excuse me, what's your name again? Or call the post office and say, who's my postman? Because they are all working in organizations and everybody has got some number, some social security, some, you know, pension payments they're ma making. We can all track them down, you know, and, and they should all be tracked down. Um, and I remind people that I'm still waiting for the badge numbers and the names of the police officers from capital, so-called capital police. I still think they might have been actors, but capital police uniform people who assaulted um, Ray McGovern. You know, I'm still waiting. They're still, they are in an organization I will not let go. I'm the bulldog of this team and I want that in names. But going back to the um, post, there's something you all in the world should know about your post system, which is it's not your post system. It's actually Switzerland's post system. But it has been sold to you as your national post system through something called Universal Postal Union. So let me share my screen and inform you about something that I didn't know anything about. But actually, it was Karen Hudis who educated me in one of her shows. Um, and she pointed to the Universal Postal Union, which is headquartered, guess where? In Switzerland, okay? Now, it's um, in Bern, okay? And um, if you go to the uh, website or the Wikipedia site, you know, one of the things that should strike you is that it has all the UPU member states and it's the entire planet. So everywhere in the world, your postal system is under the auspices of the Universal Postal Union. Okay, so on the one hand, this is because, you know, if you want to send a letter from somewhere from, I don't know what, Zurich to Timbuktu, you have to have a com complete chain of integrity to make sure that nobody steals the package or whatever, you know, rewrites your letter and reads it. So which used to happen quite a lot and still does actually. But one of the things that in the world of global cartels we should keep an eye on is also the fact that Universal Postal Union's logo is that of the UN and, you know, the United Nations, which I by now call the United Nazis. Um, and it has this, the UN, that is, has this curious logo of the entire world, you know, let's click on it, the entire world in crosshairs, pretty much, sniper's crosshairs, and then the wreath, or maybe Julius Caesar's laurels, I don't know, I don't know, but it has a lot of cartel signaling, so that's the logo of the UN, and it's the logo of the Universal Postal Union. In other words, and so what's stated here, the Universal Postal Union or your post office is a UN specialized agency, wherever you are in the world. Now, what this means is that if the cartel is against you, your post, all funny things will happen to your post, you know? So that's one thing to note. We have to really, you know, we have, suddenly mankind wakes up and we realize all our institutions have been rewritten, the statutes have been rewritten, contracts have been made, and the organizations we thought we knew, like the police, hospitals, and, and you know, postal stations are not what they are, what they used to be. They are something completely different. And typically, they are owned by the cartel. Um, so it, connects, it also it connects, connects with the UN, right? It all connects with the UN, ultimately. I mean, the police, the postal systems, the, um, the sanctuary cities, the smart cities, the resilient cities. These are all connections with the Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, the UN, and that UPU, which owns everything. And that, you know, that, that wreath, that's very interesting, actually, Catherine. We should analyze that at some point. You know, it's got so much symbolism locked into it, harvesting symbolism as well.
Oh, absolutely. And I, I actually, after what I've seen in Hungary and in Austria and Switzerland and wherever I travel, I think we should have one techno episode dedicated to cartel signaling entirely because yeah, the world yeah. looks different once you understand the cartel secret gangster language, you know, it's gangster talk. And once you understand it, whenever you see the Masonic police or the Masonic FBI showing up at a mass shooting, getting in front of a camera and doing their little things with their hands and, you know, their little colors and their black and white and this and that, you totally figure out they're actually telling you it's a false flag. They're telling you it's a farce. It's a psyop. It's theater. You know, we're, we're clowns. We're playing a game. You know, we're on the chessboard. We're on the Masonic chessboard, etc., etc. So I think increasingly, I think we need to start probing that, you know, and speaking out at that level, not taking any more of their gaff, you know, just not taking it. Absolutely. You know, one one note about now that you mentioned the, um, you know, the Masonic symbolism everywhere. Yes, it is global. And um, the Masons, I still maintain that the Masons are front organization of the Vatican Intelligence Agency, of the Vatican Mafia. And yes, the, yeah, they are global. And uh, one of the things, if you are in the UK, um, I would like, um, I pointed that out before, but I would like to continue to point that out because, you know, people need to wrap their head around it. May I just share my screen? There's two things that are glaring, glaringly obvious in the UK. Once you know about cartel signaling, one of them is the police. Okay. So the police head, hats have this black and white Masonic tiling, then blue and white here, you know, and so on and so on, but also in the UK now, so here you can see the uh, black and white tiling, the Masonic tiling around their, you know, hats. That's because they are policing the, mas the floor of the Masonic temple. And now that you mentioned false flags, um, Ramola, I think it's really important that in the UK, certainly, people realize that when there's a false flag, two units turn up. It's the Masonic police, and it is the Masonic ambulance services. Yes, here, the Masonic tiling plastered across the new ambulances these days. It didn't used to be like that, but it is like, like that now, you know? That, that is shocking. <laughs> that is so obvious. They're actually literally signaling to everybody, look, we're here. Yeah, we're here, we have taken over. So should something happen to you in a car accident and then the Masonic police rips you off, you get into a Masonic ambulance and you know you end up chipped inside the Masonic ambulance. I think um, Millicent was told by an FBI agent that yes, they chip people in the ambulances after car crashes. You know, you've got the police, the police lieutenant, I think, told her that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and, and also if you if you're against the cartel and you're taken to a hospital because you're shot at with a directed energy weapon, don't be surprised if they finish you off in hospital because, you know, you just fought the Masons and you went to Masonic Hospital. But the real shocker is that we let this apps this secret society, the Masons are a secret society who exclude most of the ethnic minorities and they exclude a hundred percent of the women. This is half the population people. So, you know, we've got something that's, uh, and, and this secret society is everywhere. It's a, it, it plastered its symbols across Hungary, across Austria. It's a hellhole, you know. But yes, the postal union is also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they're outside my street currently. So if you hear any huge noises, I'll try to switch my mic off. But um, they're supposedly here with their massive heavy duty trucks to fill in my neighbor's swimming pool, the same neighbor who has been involved in many ways in assaulting me. And, uh, you know, I've spoken about this at other times, but uh, he's one of the compliant neighbors who will come out and wear the color codes and dance and sing um, as required, whenever required by the secret societies. Um, and, you know, they're making a heck of a racket. I don't know why they're pulling into the other neighbor's driveway, but hey, they've got big trucks, you know, we're on techno. They've got you know, to uh, make their presence you know, known. What you should do just for the laughs is to go over to your neighbor, have a look at the swimming pool and say, how come you're not tiling the bottom black and white? <laughs> That's what I expect you to do. Isn't that regulations in the he's Mason? Not, you tile he's everything not, black and white. 
taking out the swimming pool it up you know with dirt so they've got their little excavation trucks out here with massive piles of uh, dirt and they are uh, they're shoving it in they they spent a huge amount of time you know drilling and removing the diving board and making a heck of a racket earlier and now they're uh, making a heck of a racket putting in the earth so <laughs> so a good place to hide the bodies huh Oh yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know what? You're talking about that, but this sort of like filling in swimming pool sort of, sort of stuff, DIY work. Yes, that's exactly where they hide the bodies. And I think Germany had this um, this court case where I think they they opened the wall because the neighbors or, or the people who moved into a home they wanted an extension and they took down a wall and they found um, bags with babies in them. Oh yeah. In you know. That's awful, but I think that's exactly the kind of thing they do. And there are so many places, I think, in nunneries and stuff where they dig up and they find the bodies of babies and so forth. I have to say they use this imagery of death, excavation, burial, shovels, etc. also as a kind of a warning note. And I've noticed the past couple of weeks that they've been sending these kinds of so-called warning notes around my path quite a bit, including a huge truck that passed by with Robert Berry written on it, like B U R Y, and guys standing with shovels at the corner as I'm driving up. You know, lunacy and lots of red around me. I mean, I've been having massive COINTELPRO. That's a whole other subject. I've been, you know, I think it's probably based re related to the podcasts I've been putting out, which have been highly tampered with. It's taken me literally two weeks to put out some of these recent podcasts. But uh, clearly, they don't want me doing it. I've experienced massive um, sabotage and hacking on my computer and freezing on my computer to stop me from posting these. And immediately afterward, incredible amounts of, you know, plane flyovers. And I actually saw. So a drone yesterday evening, as I was sitting in the backyard, fly past me a small white drone. So the thought struck me, United Nations drone. You know, they are using white yeah. to signify UN these days. Oh, do they? Because I noticed I'm being swarmed these days by, by white vehicles, and I couldn't figure out what it was. White is UN. White oh. is UN. Ever since Jade Helm a few years ago, when there were all these UN trucks rolling into the US, with white trucks, they have been using white both in cars, SUVs, and in trucks. These trucks, by the way, the heavy trucks outside, are white trucks, but they've got a private corporation's name on it. MT Mayo Corporation with Mac written on the top, you know, written on the front of the trucks, M-A-C-K. Um, and I think there are some connections there. I need to explore these a little bit. Mac is connected, I think, to some ancient treaties as to who owns the land, etc. You know, this whole notion of exploring what's going on. Uh, is very important because one, we are being inundated with white. We've, I've got neighbors playing, putting green lights out. Now, green is connected with the green Agenda 21, I think, Agenda 2030, United Nations Agenda. Um, of course, as we know, green is also connected with Joseph Mengele, whom I've been exploring a little bit because I'm going to write an article um, on the subject of um, MK Ultra and how Mengele is... is uh, was associated with it. And, and also I'm actually reporting currently on Barbara Hartwell's first podcast with me, where she mentioned that Mr. Mengele had visited her home and her sister in particular was associated with this. So I'm going to be reporting on that first podcast, which had a lot of bombshell information. But you see, these are the connections. The connections are, they go right back to Mengele. They go back to the Nazi days. They go back to paperclip. And so I think increasingly, as we begin to understand all of this, we just speak openly about it. And that's sort of where my thinking is currently, you know. The poison that won't go away. Unfortunately. Yeah, it well, won't yeah. go away. And it's established itself over here, you know? I think we yeah. need to understand this is a Nazi operation. There are other aspects, of course. I'm not saying there aren't, you know, Zionist, Masonist, uh, Khazarian, uh, Catholic, Jesuit, Vatican, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the Nazis uh, also play a large part. Um, I think, um, uh, sorry, just a second, let me just uh, finish. So I was doing something in the background. You know, one of the things I think we need to figure out is that... Um, 
So one of the things I was trying to track is that systemically there's this Uber cartel in the world that has been found by the math, uh, by the mathematicians and systems analysts here in, in ETH Zurich, um, and they looked only at the commercial side, so the entanglement and you know the cartelization of these global corporations, and they found that there's this huge entity, this you know at, which is controlled from the top. It's one organism. But they only looked at the um, publicly known corporations. Now, there are private corporations which are not listed in here, you know. And then there's also the businesses which are the most profitable, which is organized crime, which is not listed. Governments are not listed and so on. And the corruption of private people is also not listed. And one of the things I, I can show, you know, on the back of it, the envelope is that once you have an organism of this size that's dominating the global economy, it must have a dark side, you know, the black side, which is organized crime and organized crime is going to monopolize itself because there's no regulation. So it's going to buy up, you know, the proper businesses. At the end of the day, what you'll end up with, according to the laws of systems physics, unless I'm missing something, is one big global cartel that will never go away unless something cataclysmic happens across the world to break it up into small chunks. And I think this is what happened millennia ago. And since ancient Rome, we're dealing with exactly the same cartel. In a sense, the Romans had a global empire. And I'm saying it never went away. It just got renamed, rebranded. Yes, there were local wars, but I more and more come to believe that they were all staged since Roman times. And all this infighting, whoever won, was already settled by the ruling crime families a long, long time ago. And if somebody fell, it's because other crime families from the very same organism, the same, same, very same cartel, got their place. So you have this kind of cycling operation going over and over, but it's pretty much the same thing that just kept expanding and sucking in more people. And I think these days we have this dual system that when you're born, you either sucked into the global mafia operation even if you know it or you don't, or you are, you're ejected and you become a you know, lifelong outsider who is being uh, preyed upon by these psychopaths. And I think it's this organism that has invented the uh, Jesuits, that has invented the Zionists, that has invented the Nazis. And it's just different branding. You know, depending on who you are and what your preference is, you might prefer different shampoo and shower gel, and then they will just brand it differently for you. For example, in Germany, there's one dominant um, washing powder manufacturer called Henkel, and they make everything. You think you're buying different labels? No, you're always buying Henkel. You know, they might call it Persil, they might call it something else. And you think, oh, I prefer this. Oh, I prefer that. You're still buying the same product. So if you think you bought the Nazis or you bought communism or you bought, I don't know what, the left liberal what's it, you still bought the same package. You just bought different branding. And I think for me, the easiest um, hypothesis to work with that kind of proved true over and over is to ignore all these differences and say there's only two things. Are you a member of this global crime cartel or are you not? And if you are, there are two distinctions. There's, are you obliviously a member or are you fully consciously a member? And oblivious members of the crime cartel were, for example, me working for St. John's College, not knowing that St. John's College is a front of the City of London Corporation, which is a front of the Vatican Mafia. I didn't know. Had I remained a scientist, I would have worked for them, not getting who's paying me. You know, Karen, if she'd continued working for NSA, she would have worked for the Crown Corporation, never knowing it's the Crown Corporation. You know, people working for the CIA, actually it says Crown in America above their door, but they'll never know because they think it's the Central Intelligence Agency. You know? And it's the same with the universities, for instance. All of yeah. the universities are subsumed into that organization. And so those of us like me, you know, teaching in the creative writing department in the English department of George Washington University, we're still very much part of that, um, you know, pyramid structure, which every academic in the US currently still is, you know, but uh, they are part of the structure. They're not targeted because they're part of the structure. The moment they start slipping out of that space, start speaking out against it, start critiquing it. That's when, you know, the structure comes after them. As you know, it has happened to a lot of academics like James Tracy and Stephen Slater, et cetera, who've spoken out. 
Absolutely. And you know, ladies, the question is, and I think, I guess, on the team, we already answered it. The question is, if that happens to you, which happened to every single person on the JIT, uh, what to do? And I think we kind of inadvertently uncovered that what the cartel hates the most is if you do not submit to the cartel, but you go freelance. Freelancing and working for yourself and for the benefit of your own family and your community or the benefit of, you know, a group of people you would like to help is, is like it's kryptonite to the cartel because they lose power over you, you know. And then suddenly you discover you were told all your life that you are a nobody and you're just nothing and you're not an expert on anything. You need to be taught this and taught that and experts will take care of it. And that's all a lie. The police can't take care of policing. Intel agents can't take, off, take care of intel, intelligence analysis and national security. It's all nonsense. We basically need each other and we all have to go freelance. I think this is the answer. We have to just go in small groups, support each other, interface with small groups and you know, go through these systems like antibodies and, and just go after the criminals and start healing the system. I think that's the answer. What do you think? I think the answer is most definitely to speak out and to expose. Um, and, you know, you can't do it from inside any of these corrupt systems and structures. You know, you have to be outside, obviously. Um, and you do have to find like-minded people. And I think this is why crowdfunding is important and why viewer funding, subscriber funding comes into play. And there are like-minded people. There are people waking up all around the world today, you know, who admire th about things that people like us are doing, people who are speaking out, people who are reporting the truth. Um, you know, you'll find that everywhere. So I think you have to have some confidence and you have to step out of the system. Well, sev several months ago, somebody asked me in an interview, you know, did the people working there in the legitimate jobs know what was going on? I said, no, not at all, because it's so compartmented that we didn't realize there was an absolute crime syndicate at work at the National Security Agency, which was pretty much uh, driven by uh, NSA security. Um, but after, you know, after they asked me that, I said, if they knew, they probably would laterally transfer, but they would be uh, held to secrecy and they wouldn't be able to tell anything about it or else they would probably be prosecuted and put in prison. But what they would do is transfer laterally to an entirely different agency. And a few months later, then I see uh, some uh, headlines saying basically that they're losing all kinds of people from the National Security Agency because they found out that NSA is spying on Americans without warrants, without justification, and they're leaving. And they're leaving them kind of high and dry, which is actually good news. That's excellent. The, the one worry I have um, right now, I think in the long term, this is absolutely excellent because I really think that uh, globally, all the militaries and all the intelligence agencies need to be dismantled because if we go and all the secret societies, they actually have to be dismantled. By now, wherever you go in the world, there's no freaking need for the military or the intelligence agencies anymore. As soon as a nation starts building a military and an intelligence agency, it wants to spy on somebody and it wants to take over somebody. Actually, we should all cycle towards a global system of just local policing, you know, and having some sort of international cooperation fighting organized crime, which is, but publicly, publicly, as soon as you build an intelligence agency or secret society, secret this and that, you, by the laws of system physics, will have deep capture before, before sundown because that's just this built into the system. Um, so I think... We need to start rebuilding absolutely everything. But right now, as we're living with these old systems, totally captured, they are huge and they have not been broken down. So what happens when good people migrate out in this, this transition phase, in the first instance, before the system collapses, what you actually have is a concentration of corrupt bastards increasing in the system. So, the you know, in my on my uh, little diagrams on the whiteboard I used to make, the green you know, people leave and then the black ones migrate up. And what we actually have around the world, and we should one day get um, uh, Dr. Lorraine Moray on because she put it really nicely in an email. She described how, um, you know, her university was taken over and, and her entire university town, she, she can see how the young people are being recruited into this organized crime cartel. And that's exactly what I see everywhere around the world. The young people are all tattooed up 
And they, they have cartel signaling everywhere, you know, the all seeing eye and this and that, and basically a painting on themselves about all the uh, symbols of the crime cartel. I'm not sure if they're aware what exactly they plastered themselves with for life, but more and more our youth looks like the, the Yakuza, you know, where the, the Japanese mafia members who uh, swear allegiance through their tattooing and the more tattooed up they are, the more deep in the mafia they are and the Japanese mafia to the point where Japanese swimming pools are banning people with, um, with tattoos because it's pretty clear that you've got mafiosis walking into your swimming pool. And you do. And, you know, I have to say one faction of this mafiosi, you know, we've mentioned the Nazis, the Zionists, etc. One faction is also the Satanists. And um, I was watching one of Dr. Paul Marco's videos recently, and he reported in that, that um, Jay Parker, I think, who had either interviewed with him or um, on another video, had reported that there are about 30 million satanists out there now i you know think about that if the u.s is overrun with this sort of satanic philosophy which we are getting information it is indeed being overrun right at the level of the militaries and the agencies you you're going to find them in your neighborhood you know you're going to find that kind of thinking that kind of tattooing that kind of total takeover transhumanizing you know whatever demonizing takeover uh, whatever their philosophies are which appear to me to be all about just pure death destruction and evil directed against everybody in sight you know so you've got the sort of satanic philosophy and satanic thinking sitting side by side with you know our thinking which is simply the thinking of normal people for, you know, just and harmonious societies and connective societies and community and good things. Um, so if you've got these Satanists sitting inside the secret agencies, exercising power over societies, then that's the situation you've got. You've got our children being taken over. This is why you have children engaged in these stalking operations, children engaged in surveilling, using their cell phones, as you know, Dr. Murray was saying, inside universities to point and shoot uh, pulses of microwave energy against others. Um, children, young people, our entire societies really are being taken over by this kind of thinking. And it's being done, of course, under the aegis of things like Community Watch, Citizen Watch, Fusion Centers, InfraGuard, Community Surveilling. You know, um, Gerald Sarsby was telling me something that I think hopefully he will speak more about. He said that one of the things that's going on is supervision of targets in communities. He used the word supervision, and I'm going to pursue this a little bit, you know, because it's the same kind of thinking as you'd have inside a prison system, you know, with parole supervision or probation supervision. Does that really mean that these 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds in my neighborhood are supervising me as I step out of my house, get in my car and drive to the grocery store? Am I being supervised by a 12 year old? Yes. You know, well, I was photographed by one, you know, and followed her. Basically, I was going back, I was walking the dogs and, you know, the nefarious activity of walking dogs. Um, and a child came up, you know, a few yards away and was taking pictures of me. And then I looked straight at her and stared at her. She suddenly became very interested in the tree above her and taking, supposedly taking pictures. So I walked back to see what, to what house that she went to, and I noticed who it was, and I will be sending the neighbors a letter. Um, Excellent. But I said something to her about photographing, you know, and uh, she said, oh, I just photographing nature. So you walk to your, you walk from your house to a tree, photographed up the tree and then walked home. And she said, yeah, yeah. I said, you're a very bad liar. <laughs> And of course, the look on her face dropped and I left, you know. Yeah. You know what, Karen? This is dead serious because, first of all, I had exactly the same thing, but I actually caught the guy. So I went down and from my house, people can look up where I live. There's something like, what, 200 meters away, a co-op where I go shopping. And on this 200 meter strip, so I know the entire neighborhood has got the actual supervision footage from my house, from the inside. So whatever I do in my house, 
including the bathroom and the bedroom, that's being broadcast to the neighbors. And these kind of dirty old farts just, you know, you can see on their faces that they know exactly what's happening inside because they just get off on it. But then when you leave the house, they come out immediately. They are training children. But also there's something that I think you drew my attention on uh, to, which is called pay stalking. So they get the little kiddies to earn themselves pocket money by, um, you know, following. If, if a target goes into the neighborhood, on their mobile phone, presumably, they get a signal and they get extra cash if they come out and photograph you and upload it to the to this thing, which is kind of like it's like the Pokemon Go game, you know, the Pokemon Go oh, yeah. with everybody to film the insides of their house and the entire neighborhood, much cheaper than Google Cars, by the way. So they got you to film absolutely everything. And it's like Pokemon Go for your child, but already brainwash and um, integration into the Stasi system. Now, I also suspect that this is much more integrated than we realize. And as soon as you, especially if you've got a child who is maybe under 20, you know, this is now past this uh, mid 80s uh, boundary, which Millicent discovered when Ronald Reagan authorized the chipping at birth of every American. So if you have children, they are most likely not just chipped, but brain chipped. So when you have that, their mobile phone will interface with their brain chip and probably give them a little endorphin release oh. when they do that task. So what we, are, what we are faced with, and this is why all the parents need to wake the F up, their children are being taken over by this Nazi slash Stasi system, which is pretty much the same thing. And the little kiddies are learning and they are getting little endorphin flashes if they are committing crime. They are being integrated into the Nazi mafia. Into and the Nazi satanic criminal organized crime syndicate mafia. And that should be underlined. And, you know, that's absolutely right. I think Dr. Moray is somebody who spoke out about that particular notion of possible endorphin um, endorsement, you know, with this kind of sudden uh, frequency, because ultimately people should realize it's all about frequencies. Yeah. Every single emotion that we feel has a uh, brain hertz equivalent, has a radio frequency equivalent that's being sent out from our brains. This frequency, or from any of our organs, and this frequency can be picked up and can be pumped back in into you. So you can be pumped in with, you know, a happy frequency or a sad frequency or a fear frequency. And this is part of what we were discussing a, a little Little bit, I think, when we were talking about Ray McGovern's situation there on the Capitol, Capitol when the police swarmed him, etc., we were talking about how we were speculating on where the police are being controlled in this fashion. Are they being made to become more and more aggressive by their brainstem being fed these aggression frequencies? Rage and anger and absolute out of your mind lunacy frequencies. So they go after people like Ray McGovern who is a peaceful person, you know, and they knock him down and they break his shoulder and this and that. I think, so, yeah. yeah the, and the answer is uh, yes, 100% definitely yes, because I've already read reports about the UK police um, having introduced a so-called Tetra communication system, a new communication system, which means they've got these communication units on their person. And um, the wives of police officers reported that their personality changed. Now, that sounds strikingly what I saw in my own family members, which strikingly reminds me of, you know, brain takeover by AI, you mm -hmm. know, or this brain shipping slash interfacing. The other thing I want to drop in is um, also this big topic of Internet of, of Things. Mm -hmm. it's really big. And it goes into the 5G system and all this. You know, it's an integrated system. And as we figured out, it's an integrated wef weapon system. And one of the things I would like to, you know, Put into uh, put out there is that the Internet of Things might actually be the Internet of Things in your body. They just don't say the last bit. Oh, you know? it is. There's the Internet of Humans. Now, this is something we've actually seen in documents. The term Internet of Humans, which is a connection of the Internet of Things with the chips inside humans to create an internet of humans, because that is the intention. That's what the singularity, the AI singularity is all about, whereby everybody's brain is hooked to the internet. Everybody's bodies are hooked to each other. And all the things in the world are hooked via remote sensors and RFID is placed on everything to everything else. So we're all one big functioning universe of AI. 
you know, and that's in a sense what people are participating in and submitting to and helping to build when they let their children become the local so-called community police to, to um, target their neighbor and point little cell phones at them as my neighbors are doing, you know, I've seen the neighbor's children doing this. And they're just pointing and recording and surveilling and monitoring and shooting shooting uh, flashes of um, microwave energy as well. Actually, the one thing I forgot to say because I got sidetracked by a thought is that, um, you know, when Karen mentioned that she um, this, this child took a photograph, what happened to me in front of the co-op is that I went shopping. When I came out, I discovered an entire setup. And I thought, okay, by now I know where they roughly stand. So I, I thought I'm going to record some footage. So I was filming these people commenting at the same time. And as they changed places, I thought, okay, who is now the person who's, who's going to, you know, man that corner? And out of, out of darkness, because it was in, in winter, it was pitch black, came a young man holding his mobile phone. And he didn't realize that um, because it was dark, his camera had already turned on the flash. And I wouldn't have realized that he took a photograph of me had the flash not come on by itself. So he just flashed me and then walked into the supermarket. And I was the only person standing there at this, you know, desolate looking place. So I went straight after him. He was roughly like 15 or something like that. And I said, excuse me, have you just taken a picture of me? He denied it. And uh, because he was so young, he just cracked as soon as I put some pressure on. I said, no, you did. Show me your phone. Show me the pictures. And of course, he complied like this, right? And he opened it. And of course, there was just random pictures and then a picture of me just standing there randomly, you know. Now, that is pay stalking. That picture, moments later, would have been uploaded to a website or into an app, I think, where he would have gotten money, you know. And, and this is now being shipped absolutely everywhere. But what people need to understand is that we have a very, very narrow time window where we can stop it. And this time window is closing because as soon as one generation is entirely hooked up to the mafia's AI system, there's no way to get them out. And the victims already can feel that because there's no way to wake up your partner, your parents, your children, your relatives. It's impossible because they've already been taken over. And you can tell that if you present them with facts that are essential for their survival, and maybe five, 10 years ago, they would have reacted a certain way. And now they are just dazed. Now that, that's takeover, that's brain takeover. Mm -hmm. Or they're hostile to anything that might shake them out of that opinion. No, I don't want any new facts. I have my opinion. Well, that's not logical. If I have an opinion about somebody, something or somebody, and somebody says, oh, well, did you know that this, you know, and uh, I'll say no. I will take in new information to reassess to see if I want to keep that same opinion. That's a reasonable human being. But if you say, no, I have my opinion on this. It's already set. I don't want new, any new facts. I don't want any corrections. I'm happy with my opinion. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they are doing. They, they're getting people to completely be so controlled that their minds are closed off, you know. And see, this is the thing that people don't get. The decades of development that the CIA has put in, that DARPA has put in, into understanding this mind control technology, into working with neurotech, into, you know, remote modification of brainwaves. The decades of development that's gone into this has culminated today in the use of some extremely sophisticated technology, which can totally wipe out a person's willpower, which can totally take over a person's memory centers, their word centers, their decision-making centers, and their analytical and critical thinking centers, and replace them with compliance, passivity, submission to authority, um, and even put specific thoughts, specific impulses into their heads. It's that sophisticated. And if you read some of the patterns that are out there, even in the public domain, you know, and you know that you have to know there is other stuff out there that's totally black, that that's not in the public domain. But just check out what's in the public domain and you can begin to get an understanding as to how sophisticated this neurotech really is today. You know, what it can do. It can actually put specific thoughts into people's heads. It can put specific resistance into people's heads. So, you know, that accounts for it. 
Yeah, and um, and we have this this really sophisticated technology which has been, um, I'm sorry to say, been developed by the old Nazi families who have never ever been actually taken out. You know, um, I mean, uh, one of the things I was trying to research and get evidence for is the scale of this satanic slash Nazi operation that is, you know, unfolding worldwide, because you're right, Ramola, actually the traditional, before the Nazis, way before the Nazis, hundreds and thousands of years before the Nazis, they had Satanism, you know, that's the thing got branded from Satanism, you know, yeah, and yeah. for example, if um, on the topic of Satanism, there's something that I would like to um, emphasize, number one, I would like to point people to the uh, speech by Christopher Story called uh, Lenin's Satanic World Revolution, where he's talking in detail. It's a great speech. And he's talking in detail, uh, detail about how um, the entire um, Lenin uh, philosophy and so on is based on satanic principles. And by the way, Lenin used to live in Zurich. Okay, there's the connection to Switzerland. And the other wonderful insight that Christopher Story shares there is the word revolution. He says, well, you know, um, he's, um, without naming it um, such, he talks about cartel signaling and the double speak, the gangster talk of the cartel. And they use our words and they have a second meaning, with they, which they secretly mean all the time. And the great art of being in the cartel is to say, speak in a way that is acceptable to the normals as an us, the non-insiders, but actually give a message to the insiders. And you can see the heads of MI6 do that all the time. Um, for example, Jonathan, uh, um, John Scarlett, you know, sorry, I wanted to say Jonathan Sumption, who is also part of the crime cartel, I believe, based on what I've seen. But John Scarlett for sure is as head of the MI6. And he's making little hints like, oh, that's a good question, you know, meaning a good question. Everybody hears a good question, but to the insiders, he just called it a good question. And he actually says it. And he grins and all the other stuff he said in these documentaries, which actually mean one thing to him and his world. And we take it to be something completely different. But one of the things I wanted to show you, which is, um, you know, we will talk about it much more when we're talking about cartel signaling. But already I want to invite interested people now that I'm, you know, just came back from Hungary. Um, if you study Hungary, you can see how old the satanic system actually is. And I pointed to the New York Cafe in Budapest with the Satan statues already greeting you on the outside and all the human sacrifice and human trafficking and sex networking being plastered into the front, you know, on the wall, literally in the frescoes. But then the biggest Christian outfit in Budapest is actually St. Stephen's Basilica. And St. Stephen is pretty big in Hungary because St. Stephen was the person who got uh, the Hungarians into Christianity. Now, if you know much about the Vatican and how old it is, and you know about systems analysis, you know the Vatican is, has been in deep capture you know, for a long time, they are mafia. So St. Stephen, Stephen, back in the day, as he then was, coming along and putting the entire Hungarian population into the Vatican mafia system means that St. Stephen must have been one big fat mafiosi himself. So I would assume, I wouldn't have thought like that, you know, five years ago when I didn't know much about cartel signaling in the mafia. But these days, um, when our friends took me on a wonderful sightseeing tour and they said, oh, you know, would you like to see St. Stephen's Basilica? I said, oh, yes, please, you know, bring it on. That was going to be, you know, very interesting. And yes, it was. And I want to point, I'm not going to walk through it now, but I want to point you to one thing which actually takes everything back, the arch back to Satanism. If I may just share my screen, let me show you. So if you type St. Stephen's Basilica into Google, you will be shown a map of, this is Budapest, you know, it has the Danube here, beautiful, beautiful. And then you will see St. Stephen's Basilica here. Okay. Now, the one thing that is absolutely breathtaking about this is that as soon as you change to satellite view, I'm not sure if I can show you, if, if I can zoom in enough. Oh, please don't die on me now. Ah, okay, here we go. It's giving me a 3D image, wonderful. Since so Stephen Basilica is absolutely plastered with satanic and Masonic symbolism. 
it takes your breath away. First of all, you notice this mosaic here that's kind of like pointing at something. And I will another day I'll talk about what's hidden there. But what immediately greets you when you're when you're coming is this is one big uh, obelisk. That's another obelisk. And on these towers, there are obelisks. Uh, Masonic obelisk, cartel obelisks, absolutely everywhere. But the total, um, you know, um, shocker. So here is one. There's one obelisk. Then that's St. Stephen's Basilica. And then the other obelisk is there. Okay. But, and this was really shocking when you walk, take, walk the steps up, you, the first thing you see is this big gate. And this big gate, okay, let me, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, sorry, uh, has actually an image of Satan, okay? So let's see if I can get the gate uh, images. Um, so the big gate, the front gate, uh, here, okay? This is the gate. And this image here is, uh, hang on, the first one you see, and that is actually an image of Satan here, okay? I encourage you, go and look at the gate. And when you come up the steps, your eye, you know, a normal sized person will have their gaze on the steps so that you don't fall over. And then when you lift your gaze, the very first person to greet you there is actually an image of Satan with little horns and everything and the goatee beard and all that looking a bit odd. OK, but that is literally an image of Satan. I have a bigger image somewhere here and I'll dig it out. But I encourage you to do your own uh, research and um and find it but what it actually means is that St. stephen's basilica has the entire satanic system already there on display and that's just how it opens you know when you go inside there's just even more you just have to know how to read it you know but that's it you're greeted by satan and St. stephen's basilica is is ancient i actually don't know how uh when when they built it but it's not you know it's not yesterday um I mean, it's not ancient, ancient, but it's like older than you would you would think. Hang on, uh, when did they build it? Um, let's look it up. 1905, completed 1905, the current incarnation. So already in the 19th century, um, Budapest was being run and governed according to satanic principles. That's what it means. So in other words, we shouldn't be surprised, right? Yeah, and you know these satanic principles, and you see this is why there's so much concern among certain people who are awake and aware, are sort of being insidiously stolen into our systems. You know, they are being sneaked into our systems via, for instance, the education system. And I encourage everybody to go check out the YouTube uh, channel of uh, the Fullerton Informer. Joe Embriano, who's doing some great work in Orange County. You know, he actually goes to the school board meetings and he's recording and speaking to parents out there in Orange County who are actually looking at the curriculum, the curriculum in the public school systems, you know, and under the guise of health education, sex education, and so on and so forth. For instance, this is one of the many different uh, problems over there. Um, there's all sorts of information about sexuality and um, permissiveness regarding sexuality being put into the middle grade school curriculum. Okay, now I've got a middle grade school kid. And as you can imagine, I'm very concerned. So under this, um, under the aegis of liberalism, progressivism, and uh, social justice for the LGBTQ world, etc. There is in fact information on such things as anal sex being disseminated to these middle graders. I find that highly concerning. You know, I think of myself as a highly progressive and liberal thinker, but I find that extremely concerning. And uh, so a lot of parents had come to a certain school board meeting and uh, recently and expressed their opinions about this to the school board, who sort of sat there looking like frozen Nazis and, uh, you know, didn't at all uh, respond in any kind of meaningful way. And um, it, it was great to see that video and to see Joe and Brianna's, you know, listen to his commentary and to watch that. But what he's really alerting people to is this fact, Satanism is stealing into our schools. You know, promiscuous thinking is stealing into our schools. 
extremely promiscuous, really, you know. And uh, also the thinking of transhumanizing, which is another part of this agenda that is stealing into our schools. And it's part of the satanic agenda. I think somewhere, I don't know where exactly, maybe it's Atlanta, I heard that there is a revolving statue of a man and a woman kind of turning into each other, like becoming one statue i don't know where it is i'll have to check it out but um that's uh, somebody else may know you know who is listening to us uh it's, it's it's been in the news that is the plan and the agenda of agenda 21 depopulation genocide bring the numbers down from whatever 9 billion down to 500 million you know robotize everybody transhumanize everybody destroy the fertility of the women destroy the fertility of the men and create androids that really is the future. This is not a conspiracy. This is not speculation, imagination, fantastical thinking. This is the information that's coming down to us from, you know, reading and understanding what this agenda is all about. So if we are to make a change, as you say, Catherine, now is the time, because that's where these people are headed with their satanic agenda. Now is the time to start speaking out. Now is the time to start figuring out what on earth is going on and start finding yourself as an individual as you say you know and start speaking out from your own self speak out within whatever sphere of influence you are within um you have to withdraw consent and you see actually uh, karen and i were speaking about this before we started uh, the show we were talking about consent and we were talking about what can those who are targeted do to protect themselves within the scenario where by the way mental health laws, community intervention laws are also being ramped up. Our Satanists in action over here are putting in legislation to really protect themselves, whereby they are trying to criminalize or mentalize, menticize the opposition by calling everybody mentally ill and then rolling in with the community health care vans, committing people, forcible psych committing or incarceration for some, you know, trumped up reason and uh, taking people out of society. Those who are speaking out are in danger of being taken out of society in one way or another. And so we were talking about how it's really important to give people the tools to protect themselves. And that actually was the subject of one of my podcasts, one of the podcasts that was so heavily sabotaged and hacked. And that was the podcast I did with Jean, Don and Tracy. I forget the number on it. Maybe it was 68 or 69. Um, it was a podcast that I did with three people who told me that they think they may be the only three people in Montana, the only free people in Montana, the only three free people in Montana. Um, and they were talking about this freedom and how they can, you, you can establish this freedom or secure your legal rights for yourself within the system of commerce by using equity rather than law. And equity is based on maxims. Um, and it recognizes that the system is based on commerce, that this is a system of commerce contract law. Everything's about contracting. You know, even when you get arrested, apparently, you're actually contracting with the police. You are consenting to be arrested. Now, this is kind of mind-blowing for most of us. I mean, who's consenting to be arrested, really? I mean, we, we think we're just being arrested, right? If somebody knocks on the door and says, show me your driver's license, and off you go to the, uh, to the jail cell or whatever. But apparently, it has to do with that all-caps name that's on the driver license. It's apparently a driver license, not a driver his license and about sticking in the addition contract on you when you accept that you were the person on the license and you know it's understanding that that name is actually the name of a corporation that's been given to the driver's license character and a corporation that's been incorporated and is the only way in which the corporation of the police department in the state that's doing the arresting is going to communicate with you. It's through the corporation on your license. So you obviously are not a corporation and neither are you a name. You are a flesh and blood living being. So I think this is part of that understanding that Jean and Don and Tracy were trying to help uh, put across that at all times you resist any kind of adhesion contracts. At all times you state clearly you are a living being. You are not a legal person. Apparently the word person is also a legal term. So you're not that legal person. You are a, a living being, a spiritual being, etc. And you have the right to, to, to speak your mind and to withdraw consent or deny consent so you don't give your consent to any act of 
terrorizing or terrorism or psychologic psych, uh, psychiatric committing that people are trying to attempt on you. You don't give your consent and you withdraw. Now they can't actually step beyond that line. The line is consent. You have to at all times hold your consent you know, to yourself. That consent is um, inviolate. To me, that's fascinating. You know, this idea of consent being so powerful so that it's a kind of a key, you know, to your own freedom. So it's something I hope to, you know, continue to explore and investigate further as we proceed. What? One interesting, um, I find it highly fascinating. I, I find it especially fascinating because I, um, um, I spent about a year uh, watching the Supreme Court live feed uh, in the UK and uh, watching how these lawyers operate and how something that was really simple on the facts was suddenly turned into something else that no one, nobody could understand. And, you know, even I, though I'm used to having to understand hard stuff, I couldn't make head or tail of what they were talking about. And um, one of the things that I that crept up on me gradually was the realization that, first of all, that's by design. And when somebody, you know, with my level of training and understanding complicated things can't even just tell, you know, anything, that is um, a, a purposeful subversion and a, a taking something ad absurdum, you know, and I think this is what they have done. So what you're describing is true. I have um, seen incarnations of that. There's also an incarnation of that in Germany, for example, where people discovered that uh, the, the um, there are two things that they discovered. I've got a book on it. First things um, that people discovered is that Germany is still under occupation legally. It is still under the power of the allies. We're still under occupation and we never cycled out. And the, the laws of occupation still apply to this day. Other, in, put another way, we're all prisoners of war. And I think that might explain how when my parents fled from you know, Transylvania to Germany, I became not just a prisoner of war, but an actual slave to be used by my six. I think a lot of that goes back to that. But um, the second thing that they discovered is that Germany is actually a corporation and your ID card, it's not an identity card, it's a personal ausweis in German. Personal meaning staff. You have a staff um, you know, staff certification. It's your, your staff of this corporation on paper, which is total nonsense. And then people dug around and they realized the last uh, legal basis to an actual country that has any sort of basis in international law was the last Reich before the, the Nazis took over. So they call themselves a Reich citizen, Reichsburger, and they say, we don't have anything to do with this nonsense, BRD company sort of thing. We're most certainly not employees. Please leave us the hell alone. We've be, we're born here, we're Germans according to the Reich state's laws and we are being governed by that. And uh, people go berserk and you have this usual thing of intel infiltrating their communities, then setting either setting people off to become violent or just infiltrators, you know, staging violent acts so that these people can be discredited. It's very interesting um, and it, it shows me that there's so much to this concept and the cartel itself is advertising that there are only companies left. But, but, now what I would like to say is I totally encourage us to learn everything about equity and how we can fight them. But I also would like to encourage that we all go back to common sense. We do not run with this nonsense that the lawyers have devised, because I tell you, you will be led up the garden path, you know, 15 ways. Uh, before you, you, you know, realize what's happening to you. I actually advocate that we, okay, we learn this, we use these tricks and loopholes to step out, but then we go back to, I don't know what's there, the common law maybe, that's what people say, we all go back to the common law, back to basics, back to common sense that we all can agree on, and we start, you know, uplifting this entire system, throwing it on its roof like a car, and go back to what makes sense. Because the danger I see, for example, right now is like the case of Millicent, where I would like to announce that again, you know, um, somebody was, who did an awful lot of work and sent letters to all the people on the contact list um, who need to be written to, has written to them, has sent them by certified post. But the chief of police in Colombia still to this day refuses to arrest uh, Randall Webster. And the captain of police inspectors, uh, you know, also 
uh, refuses to arrest Randall Webster. And, um, you know, the governor of the state has been contacted and absolutely everybody of importance. And they all seem to be under a vow of silence. By the way, the mafia has a vow of silence and they don't do anything. And by now, the, um, the evidence is so egregious that I would say, yes, what this proves is that they are all in together. They are all members of an organized crime. You know, but if you're now going to the police, it turns out the police is a corporation and you're just contracting with them. How do you get the police to to arrest Rand Randall Webster? Maybe he does says, oh, I'm not contracting with you. I can go on mutilating Millicent. I can go on murdering people in the community, then gloating out afterwards about it through the intercom system to Millicent's ear chips so that Millicent has listened. To this guy, day and night, gloat about how he murdered, you know, you know, she has to come back and really tell the story. Um, I think, I think, Catherine, there is actually a way, and that's one of the things that I personally would indeed like to investigate through through the system or understanding of equity. I'll tell you how. One of the ways in which you can protect yourself through the system of equity is to take that all caps name, which is, you know, on your license and which you're being identified by and being enslaved by, really, because that connects with the story of the birth certificate, how your name is taken from your mother. Your mother gives you a name, your given name. Your mother is, is given this form and told, please fill out this form. The moment she fills out the form, what she's really doing is not handing the baby over so much as handing the name over. She's writing the name down thinking she's, you know, registering the, the birth of her child with a benevolent uh, government. But what she's really doing apparently is handing the name over as a, on a form that is the property of a corporation. So that corporation then begins to own that name and comes after that name at all times. And every time you say you are that name, the addition contract gets stuck onto you and you become seen as that name and that slave, therefore, et cetera. Now, when you, when in the system of equity, when you try to secure your legal rights, what you need to do is take that all caps name and register it as an assumed name for a business, as a doing business as name. You become a name holder for that name, and then you do a durable power of attorney, in fact, for that name. In other words, you are establishing that you have power of attorney over that name, which up till now you have thought is your own name. So you're doing it. And in the US, you can do this for the cost of $50 at the state of Minnesota. You can do this tr through the uh, Secretary of State of Minnesota online. You can actually establish, you know, you can register your name. So this apparently is the remedy that's being given by the government corporation to the people. And apparently at all times, even as they try to totally tyrannize and enslave you, they're supposed to provide remedy. And this is the remedy they are providing. So uh, to understand this again, you know, takes a lot of reading. I highly recommend the book that Jean recommended, which is Henry Gibson's Suits and Chancery. I actually really want to read this book. I started reading it online. You can get it online at archive.org. It's free. It's a PDF. It's about 1,200 pages long. But it's written in that wonderful old English, which is truly a pleasure to read. So um, I'm actually going to try to print it out and read it. It's easier to read when it's printed out. Uh, and what it does is it has a whole bunch of different forms, different kinds of forms, writs, pleadings, letters, et cetera, to use in different situations. So I'm, I'm actually interested in exploring this whole notion, this whole jurisdiction or jurisprudence of equity to see how useful it can be and whether indeed it can do what you were saying, Catherine. We are living in a situation where Anti-personnel electromagnetic technologies are being used on people, both from the level of law enforcement through wrongful targeting, putting, on, putting people on watch lists, et cetera, all wrongful. And also with the US military in the US, I'm talking about the US, of course, with the US military in the US Air Force happily doing non-consensual experimentation using this weaponry, directed energy weaponry, and the CIA and DIA doing non-consensual experimentation using incredibly horrific neurotechnology. 
That's the situation we're faced with in the US and very similar situation as I understand it in Europe, in Australia, etc., with militaries being involved, with intelligence agencies being involved. And this because the same protocol is being used on them, you have to think there is, you know, a connection between these intel agencies. They're working very similarly. And you know, there is information now coming out that the CIA, the FBI and the NSA all are either operative in all countries around the world or have connections with the intel agencies around the world. In fact, I was just reading yesterday about clandestine tradecraft that the CIA practices. And apparently the CIA, which is sort of the progenitor of clandestine tradecraft for the entire world, has connected with, um, uh, what is it? The MI, MI6, I think, in in Britain and the Mossad in Israel to have them assume the risk to run the operations and assume the risk in their own countries rather than you know the CIA doing it at all times. Uh, that's one way in which clandestine tradecraft is practiced by other intel agencies around the world. Uh, this is by the way a book called you know uh, CIA clandestine counterintelligence, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about that book if, uh, shortly in my in one of my own podcasts. But uh, another way in which um, other intelligence agencies do the same kind of thing is because the CIA has actually given them the instruction manual. Um, so you know they're practicing very similar activities. So given the situation, okay, given the situation that's kind of worldwide, how do you how do you protest? What rights do any, does any citizen have? And um, I think one of the ways to do that is to investigate how you can step out of that system and how you can tell that system that they can't step on you. And one of the ways that in, in, indeed in which to do that under equity apparently is to put out your fee schedule. When you do this durable power of attorney, in fact, you create a fee schedule. If you wish to send me letters, if you wish to take up my time on the telephone, here's my fee. If you wish to use uh, weapons on my body for your non-consensual experimentation purpose purposes, here's my fee. You know, whether it's $100,000 an hour or, or $1,000 an hour or whatever it is, you can create a free sch fee schedule and you can publish it and you can hold them to it. Well, is that, that's the question I have. I mean, I have several, several things I, that uh, popped up into my mind, which is, um, first of all, um, going back to the entire birth certificate thing, the way it's currently practiced, and I could completely agree with you, is that you're, you're registered at birth, and yes, you do become property of the state. And yes, they, they first of all, they, they think they get ownership of the name, whatever the hell that means, and then they can do whatever the hell they want with the person, because that's what actually happens in um, uh, de facto. Um, now, one of the things I would like to say about that is there are two points. Number one, it is a fraudulent contract. There's fraud because the contracting parties, as soon as you're actively misleading a contracting party and you get this, this contracting party, if this is really how we want to talk about it, to agreeing to something that's first of all not written on the form anywhere, because I don't think mothers would actually do that when they, if it were written anywhere, by, by filling out this form, you're passing on the name or the copyright, whatever the hell you want, to this name, and then we'll sell it on the stock market, and then one day you'll wake up and find your, your child chipped and shot at the directed energy weapons because you put this in there, you know? Nowhere does it say that. Therefore, the contract is null and void for that reason already because of fraud. The second reason why it's null and void is because this, this, this trick is not new. This is what I'm trying to say. This entire satanic system goes not just back to the 19th century with St. Peter's Basilica. It goes back to the founding of the freaking Vatican. And this entire thing in the Bible about contracting the, with the devil, guess what? It's contracting with the mafia. That's what it means. It's, this is the same old trick. You know, but law has already cottoned on to this and there's a concept called an unconscionable contract. You can't just, you know, write it into a contract and say, yes, I would like to be, you know, I don't know, chopped up or, you know, fed through a wood chopper. You can't do that. And anybody who makes you write this, uh, even if you sign it uh, out of your own free will, people still can't put you through a wood cho chopper, you know. Because it's an unconscionable contract. It's null and void. You can't say yes, but he agreed to it. So here, you know, he had the pieces. 
No. Well, the fact is nobody's agreed to it. You're absolutely right. Nobody agreed to it. That is the fraud. That's the basis of the fraud. There's no in informed consent for any of this, you know, starting from the birth certificate, no informed consent, total fraud. It is absolute and utter fraud. But remember, based on that fraud, they are still going ahead and treating people like slaves and doing this non-consensual experimentation on them. Yeah, and the second, I, I totally agree, but the one thought I had is um, I can already smell the next scam, okay? And I'm not saying this is all rubbish. I'm saying you're 100% right, Ramola. And now thinking a step ahead, because if now the entire US population wants to buy themselves free because their mother signed a form, you have to pay $50 to what? To buy yourself, a uh, slave self free from your slave traders? Now, if everybody in the US pays $50 with 300 350 million people in the US, that's what, 17 something billion dollars you pay to what? To the Secretary of State? You pay them what? The entire US nation will be bought free for 7.17 point something billion? I totally agree, Catherine. I'll tell you what, that thought crossed my mind as well, because it came to, you know, as I was, you know, trying to examine and explore all of this, the question came to my mind, if this is the answer, you know, it can't be that I'm just trying, you know, finding this out right now, other people must surely have, you know, tread this path much earlier and try to figure this out, etc. Now, very interestingly enough, this um, particular, I'll just tell you this because it's, it's a cartel, a bit of info that's connected to what you're saying, um, you know, because I totally, you know, examine this no notion that there, this, there's a scam involved. So um, this, uh, there is a statute, I, uh, in, I think the Minnesota code, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not entirely certain, but, but you check if it's the Minnesota code or if it's the US code, I think it's the Minnesota code. There's a statute in the Minnesota code that permits this assumed name or permits these businesses to be registered in Minnesota. Okay. And that statute is statute number three, three, three. Okay. And if you have any disputes on this business name, if as a business, any, any, uh, you know, disputes arise or whatever, they are going to be um, adjudicated in the county, that county in Minnesota where everything is established. And that county is Ramsey County. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. When, when I went to UPS, okay, so I bought, I actually paid money. Now, now I realize now I shouldn't have done it, but I was in such dire straits, as you know, two or three weeks ago when I was faced with all this nonsense about my the possibility of my child being taken away from me. And I started to, you know, I went after this big time. Um, I got a, U, um, a PO box through UPS. So I went to the UPS um you know, post, uh, what is it, the UPS uh, site over, over here in Quincy, and I uh, did the requisite thing. And I actually paid a lot of money to get this PO box, all right? And as I'm getting in my car and I'm driving back, or was it when I was going there, I forget, I saw this van pulled up on the side and it had this license plate, 333MC2. In other words, 333 is also mind control, mind control two, the second form of mind control. So, you know, I immediately, because of all of this, I was very, very suspicious of this whole scenario myself, because obviously, as I said, it's within the system. You're paying UPS. UPS is part of the satanic construct, completely and absolutely. UPS and FedEx trucks are being used, you know, with electromagnetic weaponry inside them on my own street. And they're being used all around Quincy. They're being used in Boston. They're being used probably in the same way around the country. Uh, UPS is definitely part of the establishment. It's part of US, US Inc. Okay, it's part of the US government. Let's put it that way. So uh, here I am giving all this money to UPS, getting a PO box, doing this, you know, thing uh, whereby I'm getting the... Um, I did the first step. I did the assumed name, okay? I took hold of the assumed name. And then the durable power of attorney is the second step. Now, I have to tell you, and I have to tell everybody, that when CPS was doing what they were doing to me, terrorizing me and my family, okay, two or three weeks ago, thanks to Quincy Public Schools, and Quincy Public Schools most definitely has not heard the last of this. I am not going to let it go. I'm absolutely outraged at what's been done to me you know, with such defamation of my name and coming after my child. Um, at the time when I did this, and what happened was 
DCF eventually sent a letter stating they found the allegations against me unsupported. In other words, the allegations of untreated mental illness that the unqualified people at Quincy Public Schools had called up DCF and given to them were found to be unsupported, as well they should be, because obviously I am not mentally ill. So when that happened, it happened after a few actions had been taken. I'd written to the governor, I'd put in a bunch of FOIA requests, several very important people had written very important letters on my behalf. One of them was Karen Stewart. Karen Stewart's letter is an absolute gem and a treasure. It is not just intended for me. I'm going to publish it on my website soon. Um, you know, it's already linked there on my site. You can download the PDF. Just go to that JIT press release. You'll get all the links over there. Um, Karen wrote a very powerful letter, which speaks for the entire nation. Barbara Hartwell wrote another very powerful letter for me. And Tracy wrote a very powerful letter for me. You know, we all know Tracy, um, so who is a friend of ours. So each one of their letters, I think, were the early letters. They were very powerful, and I think they made a huge difference. But I also think this action of mine to do this, you know, to take a hold of this assumed name was indeed helpful because it pushed them away. It was a deterrent. I think it let them see. And of course, I got pretty vocal, pretty, you know, uh, immediately. I got on people's shows. People invited me to, to shows. And I got online. I got on air. I spoke my mind. I said everything I'm saying right now, you know. So publicity, speaking out, journalism, letter writing, community support, and many other people wrote letters as well, all of which I have posted currently. And I think every one of those letters have helped. Uh, plus this particular action, inequity of taking hold of that all caps name, I think sent a very strong deterrent message to DCF, to QPS, and to everybody involved that I'm not going to take this lying down. I'm going to come after you with everything I've got. You know, you cannot enter my house. You cannot knock down my door. You cannot disrupt my family. You cannot invade my privacy. You cannot harass me in this fashion. It is outrageous. It is egregious. And I will stand up to it. I will not permit you to do this to me. I think that's the message, you know, that actually went across. So the other, the other situation, can everybody in the US do this, spend $50? I certainly agree. You know, that I think is not the answer really, but I think that is the remedy that's been inbuilt in the system, you know? And it is MC2, it is mind control two, just as the entire system is mind control one, primarily, I guess, and fraud number one. Um, so I think it's a remedy, but I think the real answer, really, I've been thinking about this and I think, and I want to probe this, probe this a lot more. I think the real answer is consent. We did not know about this fraud, right? This is unconscionable fraud. It's an unconscionable contract. It's not a contract because we never acceded to it. We never assented to it. Our mothers actually never assented to it either. You know, any one of our mothers who signed that, they didn't think they were informants. You are seeing them as informants because you wrote those cunning clauses into your trickery forms, right? That doesn't mean they're informants. They're mothers. And because of that, that contract should not hold water. Nothing should hold water. It's consent. It's just the spoken word. Our spoken word should be powerful enough to push these people back and to say BS to your systems. We don't recognize them, you know? That, that's actually, it goes to the, to the core. As you were speaking, I, I just brought up something because what you're saying is entirely right. And I would advocate the following. I believe this is a scam, but I also think this is a millennium old scam that goes literally back to biblical times. A lot of it, for example, the, the, the fraud and banking, uh, people in the medieval ages already declared that uh, usury is, uh, you know, a sin. It's a crime, you know, against God. Well, what did they mean with usury? They meant interest on interest, guys, which is what everybody is paying now. Islamic banking outlawed it long ago. That's why they are so against Islam and Islamic banking, because they cottoned onto their bullshit a long time ago. And the banking cartels at the heart, the Intel cartel, the banking cartel, the organized crime cartel are one. And there are some things that are absolute pivot points to them. And I agree with you. Everything you said is, is true. This is exactly how the system works. And I think the solution is the following. 
a few people pay the 50 pounds or 50 dollars to go through these rigmaroles to step outside the system and then once you're outside the system you just bring the entire freaking thing down you go back into court or you re-establish your own common law courts and you say okay guys let's come together let's really look at what this actually is but for that you need a clear mind for that you have to have the entire mind control operation switched off you know so I, I think the solution is a few people go through these rigmaroles, report back about what this is all about so that we really understand and then we take it all back. And we also have to understand what common law is. Basically, we have to understand from first principles, all of us, what everything in our world actually means. You know, what does medicine actually do and mean? What does law do and mean? What does intelligence work actually do and mean? And all this other stuff, engineering, we all have to become a jack of all trades. We all have to become polymaths. I'm sorry. That's what it just means to be human because we all individually have to be able to keep a check on everybody, the spooks, the lawyers, the police, the doctors, the physicists, the engineers, everything. And I, I would like to... Um, recommend that people start this education on the topic of law a really good introductory course about how this corrupt system has been set up absolutely millennia ago as for me personally i really love this speech because it opened my eyes it's by santos bonacci and it comes i think in two or three parts all of this is up here it's about law and language and it explains how the the language that is used in court goes back to the phoenicians and it goes back to the Venetians and the black nobility in Venice. Now, why does the black nobility come from Venice? Well, because the big banks were there, okay? The banking operation, Florence, Venice, hugely important. The Phoenicians were big traders in, in maritime trade. So maritime law goes back to that. And like all systems, you know, like the, the mafia was really big in the, uh, in the shipping trade and in the mining trade in Russia. And that's because all the heavy boys were on ships, right? Because they have to carry heavy stuff. So when you had a psychopathic, big, muscly guy, he could muscle people out of the way, right? So when you have an entire shipload of big, muscly, psychopathic guys, they can push their will through which is why they pretty much set up what maritime law was going to be because they, they were pirates, okay? So what we actually have is pirate law. That's just why everything is so messed up, okay? It is pirate law, exactly. That's the best way to put it. You know, it's not mercantile law, admiralty law, it's pirate no. law. The law it of the pirate law. Exactly. And actually, one of the things I would, I, I'm aware we probably have to close soon. I'm not sure when you guys started, but I want to say a few things, okay? Which is, um, I, I really... If people think I'm hopping about too much from St. Peter's and uh, Stephen's Basilica to the mafia and to maritime law and all this, it is because we all have to start opening our eyes and take off our blinkers and realize it is all connected. But at the end of the day, in every corner, we're just fighting the same system. But for those people who are from the Anglo-American background, because we speak English, I would like to bring it home to you how very, very much this sort of stuff matters, what we're talking about, because it affects you in the UK, certainly, immediately. The Phoenicians affect you immediately, the mafia affects you immediately. And the way I would like to bring it back, and I would like to tie it in with something that I did, I think last week or the week before, I actually went public on Twitter again about how I was stalked by the Supreme Court judge, Jonathan Sumption, now known as Lord Sumption. Now, I, this goes back, but one of the things I would like to say is that this means he was stalking me. He also stalked me in Munich, 50 meters from my house, which means that he has access to the MI6 Intel network, which in turn means if MI6 is a front for the mafia, for the City of London Corporation and so on, which we're going to elaborate later, it means that this man is not actually to first order a Supreme Court judge and an independent Supreme Court judge. He's a plant of the cartel. I actually think what this means is that Lord Jonathan Sumption, based on what I have seen with my own eyes, I think that is evidence that he's a plant of the cartel. Okay, 
Now, there's a precedent for this because we have, you know, we have Judge Scalia who died under rather mysterious circumstances at a ranch which might be involved in pedophile sacrifices by a guy who was involved in the shenanigans, financial shenanigans of the cartel and, and heck knows what and what happened in Latin America. Big cartel guy. And funnily enough, his family wasn't interested in an autopsy. They were like, oh, go worry about the autopsy. Most important thing is he's dead. You know, how curious. How curious, could it be that something much, much darker is hidden exactly again in the story of Scalia that really the family didn't want to bring up, you know? So, whoa, that is the Supreme Court in the United States. My testimony connects to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. But what I'm actually saying is, I don't know about Judge Scalia. I can only deduce on the evidence people put out there, but I do know about Jonathan Sumption because he stalked me he was the person who was instrumental in getting the case of the Jersey Senator Stuart Sivray, who was actually investigating the pedophile rings in Jersey, right? He investigated the pedophile rings in Jersey. Then he was a senator and the Senate kicked him out. And he was, I think, suing because of unlawful sacking or whatever. And they brought in Jonathan Sumption, who was a judge on the Court of Appeal in Jersey, and he threw this case out. Right, thereby depriving, I think, uh, Stuart Suvere of his income source. You know, doesn't that sound like targeting? But one of the things that uh, Suvere said, apart from the fact that the court case had massive irregularities based on what I've read, he also said that Jonathan Sumption showed him absolute disregard. He just showed him contempt during the court case. He was picking his nose, he was rolling his eyes. That was on the blog of Stuart Suvere, which I read when I started investigating Sumption just by using Google when he started stalking me. And I thought, hmm, back in the day, I didn't know the importance of pedophile rings and protecting the pedophile rings. Today, I know exactly the importance. What is the value of pedophile rings in Jersey and what connects pedophile rings in Jersey to the MI5 slash MI6 stalking network in the UK what connects all this to my stalking and what connects all that to maybe a judge who might be a plant on the Supreme Court? Hmm, it's the same operation. That's what connects it. This is based on what I know. Okay, so these are all really important things. But one of the things I would like to say today, everything I said already, I think, said in the past. But what, one of the things I would like to say is that when Jonathan Sumption started stalking me in Oxford, because I was already working on the court anyway, and how the court system works, I went down to London because I was watching the Supreme Court via the live stream over the internet. And I thought, well, it's a public hearing. I'm just going to go and watch some court cases. And I did. And I watched some where Sumption wasn't on the panel of judges, but I also watched some where he was. And I thought, okay, now let's just see. I know he's stalking me. I'm just going to walk into the court, sit down, and just watch the case because that's my job. It was curious because this guy sat there, and after about half an hour, he had a little fit. He turned bright red. And this I think I went to the court three times. In three hearings, he was the judge. And this happened every single time. After half an hour, he had a fit. Now, the, with fit, I meant he turned bright red in the face. He was shaking. He has a tick whereby he's like, you know, uh, yanking his head sideways occasionally. And he started doing that. He couldn't calm down. And he really was struggling with this. And then eventually he, he's calmed down. And when he was in his most distress, when people are really distressed, they usually look to friends. And I watched that when this happened, he looked over to a guy called Judge Clark. Now, Judge Clark was interesting because from his body language, I thought, I think these two people are closer than with the other judges. They are friends. So I started investigating Judge Clark. He's now retired. And funnily enough, one of the things I found is that Judge Clark is, was in the City of London Guild for the, 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 the shipwrights or whatever it's called, whatever, the stuff to do with shipping. I have to look up the exact title. And I thought... We have one judge, Supreme Court judge, who I think is a plant by the cartel, which is supported by the fact that he leapfrogged everybody in the, in the English judiciary. He was never an English judge. He was a judge in Jersey, but not in England. And then he became a Supreme Court judge. Boom, from barrister to Supreme Court judge like that. 
And then he's also celebrated in the British press, like the cleverest man in England. Oh, wow. The cartel really loves the man. What might he have done for the cartel that he so loved? And then a very close friend by my own testimony was Judge Clark. And Judge Clark, funnily enough, on Wikipedia, it said that he was a member of the guild to do with shipping in the city of London. Now, what's the connection between all that? And I say, Judge Clark was, I think, an expert on mercantile law. Um, I think when you become a member of the chambers in London, which are a story in themselves, they're like Oxford colleges, I think they are to do with the Templars and the City of London Corporation. But eventually, you're probably encouraged to join when you're a young man. And you might not realize that what you're joining is the mafia. Okay, but as long as you play along, and you stay in the guilds and the Oxford colleges and the ends of, of law and so on, and you do your thing, as the cartel desires, you're being, you know, promoted up. But the bottom line is that when we have people like that on the Supreme Court, some judgments are just down to three people. If you pair up two people like that, and maybe they are deep in the cartel, I'm not saying that Judge Clark is deep in the cartel at all. I'm just saying that he might have, as a young man, joined something that's actually a front for the mafia without noticing. And there are thousands of lawyers like him. And they might not even know what they're in, you know, what sort of club. But at some point, the question arises, when you have these people being members of the guilds, being members of the Freemasons, or maybe privately stalking women in Oxford using the services of MI5 and MI6, and they are Supreme Court judges, how much can we trust their judgments? You know, if they are a plant of the cartel, how much can you judge their, their judgments? Aren't they not going to be cartel members first and foremost, and then they just happen to be also masquerading as Supreme Court judges? Because the more I thought about it, the more I thought, hang on, let's think back to all the judgments I actually heard, you know, um, being said. And I now ask everybody, based on my own testimony, to have a good look. I am going to take my testimony to court based on what I did. And I said to my husband, I'm being stalked by Johnson Assumption years before I even knew I had chips in myself, right? So that was a big discovery. But I would like in, to encourage all the investigators who are out there, because I really think this is much bigger than just me and Assumption. Um, I actually ask you all to familiarize yourself with the Supreme Court UK YouTube channel, and I want this more for educational purposes, okay? This is not a personal vendetta against assumption, which I, you know, emotionally I could have, but I really don't have time for this. I think we should use this to system judo to something better in the 21st century than what we had. And it requires that we understand men like him, what got him to do what he did, and then we figure out what the F to do that we shut the system down. So if you go to this YouTube channel, this is super important for everybody in the UK. Go to videos, and here, this is wonderful, actually. I love the UK Supreme Court. They are really ahead of the time because they are uploading all their judgments onto YouTube. Isn't that great? And you can actually see it wherever you are in the world. You can study these judgments. For people who are students of law, I really recommend you do that, okay? And here, the man who stalked me is this guy, the guy with the white hair here. And you can look how he's reading out judgments. You can see his ticks, which he has. Um, and then you can also listen to what he said. But one of the things I need to dig out is one judgment, which really struck me because it, I now realize it connects straight back to targeting. It was the case, and it actually reached the Supreme Court, of two protesters going to an arms fair in London, okay? And they protested outside. They didn't do anything violent, they just protested. When the protest was over, they wanted to go back home. So they started walking back to the, to the tube station, the London Underground Station. And on the way, some, I think, undercover police and some guy who masqueraded as a reporter photographed him. So they were stalked, right? And disconcerted by something these days I recognize as intimidation theater, street theater. But they were photographed and so on and so on. And then this got into a police database and yada, yada, yada. I have to refresh my memory about the case. But in the end, I think the story was that these people got themselves recorded in a police database, even though they didn't do anything wrong. And I was shocked. And the Supreme Court decided that that was okay. 
I have to go back and check if they actually got their DNA registered in the police database for nothing more than protesting. Had I back then knew how important it was, I would have bookmarked the bloody case, but I didn't. So I have to dig it out by going through the Supreme Court website. All the lawyers who are listening, if you can assist me and remind me which case that was, um, you know. But the really important thing is that Sumption was on the panel. It was, I think, one of these court cases with only three judges. And at the time, he had already been stalking me. Had, he had already used the police's and MI5 and MI6's services provided to cartel men like him to stalk women, young women, back in the day, I was pretty young, right? And now we have the same man and he's authorizing the sort of stalking street theater behavior by the police. Is that right in any way? I don't think he was independent. He actually decided that it was okay to do something that he did in his free time. And that's, that's what I wanted to say today. You know, this is why this shit we're talking about is so important because the stuff, this really nasty stuff, the Phoenicians dreamt up and were successful with looting the entire world. And you guys should go to Venice and see what it looks like. They have the loot from around the world there because these guys were pirates. They stole from around the world. And the same in Florence, the same in the Vatican. And then okay. the legal and system. Also and also, don't forget the British Empire. Don't yes. forget the Queen, Buckingham Palace, the Tower of London, etc. Booty from around the world, you know. Exactly. And you know what, Ramola? I'm so glad you brought it up because actually, one of the uh, what's it called? The what's it diamond? Uh, I can't pronounce it. The, the one. The new diamond. Yeah. Yes, that one. It's in the Tower of London. And guess what? The Tower of London is. It's not actually in Buckingham Palace. So, you know, Lizzie doesn't have her jewels. I've seen it. I went to the Tower of London two years ago and I checked it out. And, you know, I have to tell you, all the Indians in line, especially the ones right in front of me, busy taking pictures of this and you're telling everyone, they stole that from India. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this big sign saying, you can take photographs of the Kohinoor Dime. <laughs> exactly. But you know, the one thing, I, I'm glad people are shouting they stole it from India because, yes, they stole it from India. But the second thing that people should be shouting next is hang on, we're not on British territory. We're on Vatican territory. This is the city state of London. This is City of London Corporation, AI, you know, or, or AKA Vatican territory. And the Tower of London is on the territory of the city of London. It actually is the boundary line, but still within that. So the crown- and The Romans own the crown ultimately, and they own the queen. Yeah, exactly. So you know what? It's, it's the Vatican. It was always, the Vatican was always the crown corporation stealing and looting all this time. You know, and then you have Sumption stalking using the stalking services of MI6, which, you know, we said in a previous episode, even John Scarlett himself admits as the Vatican Secret Service, you know, the C, the crown, nothing changed. That's what he, what he revealed, you know, grinning smugly to himself as he does. Yeah, we've got Vatican intelligence agency called MI6 providing stalking services to Sumption who protects the, you know, Crown Corporation's pedophile human trafficking rings in Jersey, gets promoted to the Supreme Court, and then he comes up with these decisions. Well, uh, you know, if one judge is corrupt out of a decision of three and there was one consenting judge, you know, I mean, you know, the, he might have actually split the vote. I think these, these, all the court cases that he tried, anything to do with targeting even remotely the Crown Corporation, have to be retried, really. Well, you know, Catherine, you know, it also comes down to the, you know, to the fact that these court systems are, you know, in many cases, you have corrupt judges, you have uh, a complete kind of closing down of cases, especially where intelligence agencies are involved. They come, they come in and, you know, claim national security and they shut things down. So that seems like a situation where the court system and the justice system isn't really working for us. It's not working for the people. It really isn't. So initially you mentioned, you know, what system can we use? And Santos Bonacci, by the way, is indeed one of the prime experts on the subject. I've, you know, heard a lot of his lectures. I love his stuff. I love his um, 
clear way of explaining things. Uh, and he talks about law and language, much like Jordan Maxwell talks about language as well. Some other people as well out there. Uh, but um, what he also talks about is withdrawing consent and stepping out of the system. And, you know, you had mentioned DNA. Does the police think they have a right to grab people's DNA? And in fact, right now, the security agencies and the intelligence agencies are acting like they have a right. And perhaps the answer to that is to tell them, and of course, to tell through them, the larger edifice, which goes back to the Black nobility and Rome and those Sesti Kavitras and uh, the Human Sanctum or whatever, you know, those initial pro proclamations and declarations whereby a 13th century Pope laid claim to the air and the sea and the br air that we breathe, etc., and the water of the earth, saying it all belonged to him and to Rome and to the popes, etc., BS, BS, BS. Um, you know, perhaps we need to convey to them a very basic message saying, you know, take your BS system and stuff it. We do not consent. We do not consent to your projection and perceiving of us as slaves or as the earth as being under your dominion. We don't consent to this conception to start with. And we don't consent to the notion that our bodies, our DNA belongs to anybody else but ourselves. You know, that kind of thing. So you make a declaration of consent. And then you have to, in a sense, protect that declaration. And I think you had mentioned common law. Now, I understand that even in the U.S., common law is part of the substructure of U.S. law. In other words, common law gives life to this law. You know, and now, of course, everything's commercialized. We've got the Uniform Commercial Code, which appears to be the basic statutes, the corporate statutes of the U.S. corporation. Um, but even there, they have to respect common law. Perhaps the answer is to pull back into the terrain of common law to set up grand juries, to set up a court system based on common law that, you know, is a just court system. Yeah, I think we absolutely should. I think you're going right to the heart of the matter because the way I understood it, and then we also have to be really careful because one of the things, so yeah, to start, I think, you know, equity and all that is a subset, it's commercial law, but that is, I think, a subset. You're kind of boxed in in a little, you know, Yes, pattern. equity is part of the system, it seems like. It's, it's a subset or it's a possibility, but it's really within that realm of commerce. Yeah, but I think it was always just for commerce, you know, it was never applied to people because I think people fall under common law. And the way I understood it is that you had common law and then you have compartmentalized little paddocks within the, you know, big wide meadow of common law. One of them is equity. And if, if a corporation is now trying to confine you to equity, I think what they're doing is they're trying to pull you down onto their level um, playing field because a corporation has to be operating within the bounds of that. And they're trying to confine you within the bounds but i would resist that i would step out and i would say no i'm sorry i fall under common law if anything you know well i i mean i think i think stepping out and getting into common law in order to prosecute may be the way to go because when you look at the situation this is a situation of inequity that we are all facing when governments and militaries think that they can freely use weapons on the populace when they think that they can experiment freely on anybody, calling them a slave to the corporation, et cetera, et cetera, that's a situation of injustice and inequity, you know? And if the court system as we have it currently under mercantile and admiralty law will not give us justice, then we have to look for options. And it seems to me that common law is an option. So my question would then be, how exactly can we utilize common law as a people, you know, as a group of people, as whole populations to combat this kind of nefarious takeover of our bodies and our beings, you know, in this and then, One of the things I don't know, and experts have to, um, you know, inform us is, um, is common law also just a sub paddock of something that's actually, sorry, yeah, common law, a sub paddock of canon law, which is the old church law, you know, and the entire point of the 30, already in the 13th century, uh, the Vatican was global, which is why the Pope could declare the entire world to be his own. 
And those who don't believe it, there's circumstantial evidence for that. For example, early maps. Do you, do you guys remember this expression of there be dragons and dragons being drawn on the white bits of maps? People thought, ooh, you know, back in the day, people were just childish and drew scary dragons. And, you know, though we don't know what, what is there. There must be dragons. No, this is not what it was. People were not children back then. People knew exactly what's there. It was the Vatican Corporation represented by the dragons looting. And they said, you have no business knowing what land's there, for example, America, because we're busy looting it. We'll tell you what's there when we bring you over slaves, you know. So there were certain parts of the map which were declassified because maps in the olden days used to be military things in the days before Google Maps, you know. Only the military had a right or the ruler had a right to know where everything is. You couldn't just say, oh, tell me where your wells and your rivers and your lakes are, you know, because people might want that stuff, fresh drinking water. So maps were a military tool, and some bits of the map were declassified by the Vatican and those you could see on the map. And then there was the there be dragons, as in there be the Vatican Corporation doing whatever the hell that they did, and it was none of your business, including things like killing nations, you know, to set up camp. So um, the one question I have is common law a subset of canon law, because if the answer is yes, which I think it might be, then we have to claw back even further and ta start taking down canon law. Because, you know, this Pope just declaring every breathing, living thing and oxygen and, and you know, being his is, uh, I think it's like a megalomaniac thing of a dirty old pedophile. Oh, you know? it is, totally. I mean, those are the primordial megalomaniacs, right? Those old Popes? Yeah. And, you know, the yeah, stories carried on by the current Pope. So, you know, frankly, one has to say, who on earth is giving any of your credence? But the problem is these guys have amassed huge amounts of wealth currently, you know, all through ill-gotten means, etc. And it's on this wealth that they're running world economies currently. That's where they have their power, right? And so that's the situation, unfortunately, we as a world population are facing. Now, there is another thought as well, and that's tribal law. Somebody had left, oh, actually, it's Karen Ann McDonald with whom I've been speaking lately. She left a, a note um, under that video that I did with Jane and Dawn and Tracy about um, how this is also de facto. This is within the de facto system, which, yes, I do understand. Um, but she left a note or video on tribal law. So I started to watch this, and I have to explore this further, but it's something I recommend people, uh, you know, check out. Um, so tribal law apparently is the law that's based on treaties made by the Native Americans with other countries prior to Columbus landing here. So that's apparently what's, you know, the law of the land, the law of America prior to whatever happened when the English landed here and the Spanish landed here, etc. Well, that would be the Indian nations with Indian nations. The Indian nations with Indian nations, but you know, he mentions other groups as well. He mentions Anglo groups and Asians and so forth. The treaties made with other groups as well. So, you know, I'm not an expert. I have to go back and listen to that again and try to figure out what that's all about. So that's another possibility, but you know, these are good questions as to where these laws came from. But what we really need, I think, is a kind of common law that is outside. Maybe maybe this is a, a, an issue of terms of reference that we need to change. Maybe we need a new name for this new kind of law that we need. Basically, a law of the people. We need a law of the people that, you know, that actually works for the people. That doesn't we work. Need, to, need to go back to the Constitution because there's only a constitutional crisis if you allow it to be. If you have some guy come to your door with a badge and, and tell you that he needs you to do something that you know is not constitutional, then you are subverting the American Constitution and our laws if you obey him. Now, few people know, and I'm, I'm hoping this is true because I did I read it, so maybe maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I'll have to go back. But I did read somewhere that it says that you have no duty as a member of a jury to convict somebody of an unconstitutional law. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you have a lawyer say, Fred Smith wore a hat on Tuesday, and our local law is that he cannot wear a hat on Tuesday, you must send him to prison for a year. And Fred Smith said, yes, I wore a hat on Tuesday. 
you are under no obligation to send him to prison for a year because that is ludicrous. That is not a constitutional law. But what we're running into with these companies and rogue feds and idiot neighbors is that some guy with a badge told me that I should kill you. Yeah. You know, somebody with some guy with a badge said that I could I should go over and poison your dog or kick your child or do whatever. Hey, it's not me. Some guy with a badge told me to do it. So obviously I have to do it. No, you don't. You know, try to get some cojones like the founding fathers and tell them no. And if you don't know about the Constitution, then shame on you. You know, because that's not going to be any kind of excuse. But we remember, we only have a constitutional crisis if we allow it. And we don't say, no, that is not constitutional. And an unconstitutional law affords nobody any type of protection for following it. So we have to, as a people, start standing up and quit being doormats. You know, the United States of doormats, is that what you want? Or the United Kingdom of doormats? No. That's a good way to basically... Uh, devolve again into brainless monkeys you know so people have got to start standing up and telling their neighbors this is not legal this is not moral and no you didn't have an obligation to do it because a guy with a badge told you so that's just absolutely ludicrous absolutely true and i think the other thing we also have to remember is that um you know the uh the constitution the, the written constitution was uh, uh something extremely powerful so was the bill of rights and um many many people died for it and the reason why they had to die for it is because back in the day they were fighting the same mafia uh you know the crown corporation that's why so many people fled to america is because they were fleeing the masonic mafia and the crown corporation that has totally infested life and made life impossible in Europe. So they had to have some sort of, you know, somewhere to go to set up. Now we don't have anywhere to go on the planet anymore. And by the way, the equivalent of this, what the 13th century Pope did, which is declare every, you know, every air, bit of air his and his property. I've heard rumors about the Pope having, uh, you know, made some sort of intergalactic agreement that everything in the universe belongs to him. I mean, this is just like, you know, this old guy needs to, he's freaking senile because what he's saying makes absolutely no freaking sense. But just because some senile old fart just said something doesn't mean it becomes law. This nonsense, you know? But yes, what they did in the 13th or 14th century, they do now. They continue. And we need to dismantle these people because they're nuts. They're actually mentally ill, totally senile, totally mentally ill, and utterly unusable. You know, and it makes no sense to me why whole systems of law are based on these ridiculous, invidious, invalid pronouncements that these ancient, you know, fogies have uh, made at various points in time. Oh, well, this is now the second bit we need to discuss, right? This is now something we need to spend an awful lot of time because the victors decide the law. But and the yeah, strongest, yeah. the people the interpretation the strongest of arms decide the law. The people who are the most ruthless in killing decide the law, which is why these days we have actually in practice mafia law. We have pirate law and we've got mafia law. You know? And you know, when you use the word mafia, I think what really people need to understand on the ground in our communities and in our neighborhoods, those intelligence agency personnel or staff or whoever from the local fusion centers who are coming along and telling neighbors in our communities to target other neighbors, to scapegoat other neighbors, telling lies, spreading stories, defaming, slandering, libeling other people in their com communities. Communities in this country, in the US and in the UK and everywhere in the world need to understand that anybody asking you to target somebody else, to keep an eye on somebody else is mafia, is not legitimate intelligence, is not legitimate government. That is a mafia action. This is a mafia action that is being run by mafiosi sitting inside our intelligence agencies, sitting inside our fusion centers, sitting inside our government. That doesn't mean all the people in government or uh, these centers or intelligence agencies are bad. They're not, obviously, you know, as we know. We're working with one. We're working with somebody who spent 28 years of her life, you know, in the National Security Agency. Obviously, she found something of worth in her work to continue working there.
you know, so I'm, this is not a blanket, um, you know, condemnation of anybody working for government by any means. But we need to understand that these principles, these practices, these, um, these understandings that lead people in intelligence agencies to go around neighborhoods and say, that person is under investigation. This is a court authorized notification to you. Look, we've got this corrupt judge. We've got a federal magistrate judge naming this person as under investigation. You have to help us. When somebody does that to you in your neighborhood, you need to wake up and understand that's mafia. That's Masonic mafia, Nazi mafia, cartel mafia, Kazarian mafia, call it what you will. These are the thugs operating inside the United States to undermine the United States just as they're operating inside the UK to undermine the UK, etc. They're undermining the normal fabric of society, the general fabric of society of which all of us are a part. You know, they're trying to take us down. These are Phoenix operations designed to destabilize entire populations, control populations, take down populations and turn people one against the other. Absolutely, absolutely. And it has one of the things I wanted to say um, is that now in 2018, we are putting names, you know, we, I think um, when I was at St. John's College, I actually did have and uh, this will appear in my evidence. When I spoke with fellows, there was this cloud of stuff, no one dared to say its name, but people were afraid of it. And they always used to word they, oh, they will do this They and I never understood who are they. And now in 2018, we will put names to they, you know, who exactly are they? And, um, and I think that's a brilliant way to go about it because, uh, you know, when you said earlier, you know, get the name of your mailman, the one who's doing the funny things. I think that's a great point. Find out the particular mailman in the local post office who is, who is doing the funny things, you know, like stealing letters, etc. Get the names because then we begin to understand who's involved and we lay it at their doorstep and we also send a very strong message to them. You cannot get away with this and stay anonymous. Exactly, and, and now, you know what, I'm back now in, in uh, Zurich, partially because I had to flee Hungary. So I spent over months in Hungary, but it was, it was worth gold because I continued the investigation. But I found out a lot of things, and I, I'm going to say it now because I think one of the things I learned is the same pattern is repeated in every country where I went. It's exactly the same. So if we figure out how to solve it in one place, we figure out how to solve it everywhere. But one of the things I discovered is that on the travel, every single country, every single country, has floating death squads. I was machine gunned from the end of my street all the way to Budapest. I arrived and uh, the friends who took care of me found me literally crashed on the bed, almost passed out because I had been machine gunned into the head all the way there. So this is one thing that's pretty universal. It's now across uh, Europe. The other thing that's universal is that neighbors are recruited to commit murder and they committed in a targeted way. I personally figured out how they, um, you know, got my grandfather into a state that he died from his injuries in Germany. He was finished off at, um, by criminals at Hospital Baden-Baden, but it was our neighbors in Hungary who had machine gunned him so much that he ended up so ill, he called the family and he wanted to return to Germany. So, you know, we had to take him back. But now they are finishing off the dog of the family next door, like they finished off my grandfather. This is what I established. And I've now honed in on roughly where these people are because they shot at me so intensely. I actually heard it bounce off every single night. I heard it bounce off my shielding. Now I'm telling you, not because I want to go my personal situation. I'm telling you because from what I heard from Karen and from Millicent and from Ramola, I'm 100% sure that the same situation is being repeated all across the US all across you know, France and Italy and absolutely everywhere. So the way I'm gonna go about it is I try to record the names of the neighbors who are involved. I made a perp map, okay? And when you're dealing with officials, take down their, their name, take record everything. And if anything is out of line, it is already evidence. So sh first of all, suspicion of, and then eventually evidence of membership in a criminal network. Right, the way the police officer, uh, Mr. Schoch at the local police station treated me, 
was not symptomatic of a police officer. It was symptomatic of somebody who was a member of a crime network, of an insider. And that was confirmed when the local police put up their posters, like, oh, beware burglars, after I complained for two years about having my, my house, you know, broken into. Um, they put up these signs, but they used the all-seeing eye showing that Zurich Canton police is actually the mafia. You know, they put up the mafia symbolism. I've got evidence. So when Mr. Schott behave, be, behaves like the mafia and his Canton police puts out mafia symbolism, oh, yeah, it all falls into place. These people are not police officers. They are masquerading as police officers. Big difference, you know. And all these people, they are not, po they are not postmen. They are, they are cartel members masquerading, you know. And when, when it's a Supreme Court judge who's actually masquerading as a Supreme Court judge, but he's actually first and foremost uh, an agent of the cartel, that's dangerous. Because at that point, he's got a lot of power, you know. And it might explain why people try to take me out. But now this, this is my evidence. Now it's out there. You guys know what happened. You know, even if they take me out, I already said it on those publicly before witnesses. Ha! You know, but I'm not saying it just because I've got a personal gripe against Sumption. I actually have a personal gripe against MI6 for murdering my family. And one of the things I want us to do is identify all these cartel members, get them out of the system, and then try to repair our systems. And we have to do it in 2018, you know, which gets me onto the um, affidavit templates, and they are finished. But I'm not, I can't release them. I can't release them because. It's now finished. I've got all the feedback. New sections have been added, you know, and many other things. I'm, I hope it's complete. I will brush it up a bit so that it's nicer. It will be published. I think it's now a matter of days. I'm just waiting to hear back from a great lawyer from Targeted Justice who's going to, you know, promised me he's going to look over it one more time. And then it's good to go. And what I really would like to appeal to absolutely everybody is that, it, by the way, it was a lot of work because... Um, you know, it's not just because of the work, it's a lot of work because I actually, to be honest, I by now I'm fighting AI. Every time I'm speaking, I fight AI. In Hungary, as much as here in uh, Switzerland and in Austria, they are moving my fingers against my will. So this means the AI takeover is pretty much complete. At any point, they can make me say or move or do things they want and I really don't want. So that's the truth. Um, and also, you can see I'm saying the truth because if I take my glasses off, of these this is radiation damage here this is all skin pigments damaged and this on my forehead are the number of times i'm being shot in the head and they damage my skin it's not spots i don't have adult acne what you see on me is injuries okay um it's pretty pretty bad i can tell you guys it's pretty bad but i want to finish on good news okay good news traveling through europe and so on i actually came across by pure coincidence really good news which is um what happened uh, yesterday is I was traveling through Austria. It was so beautiful. I drove off the motorway into a forest trying to escape, you know, the, uh, the stalkers. I ended up in the middle of nowhere. I parked my car. I took my, uh, my laptop and I went up into the forest onto a bench. And I was actually completing the affidavit template in perfect peace. I had like two hours of just n no shots to the head and I could think clearly. It was like heaven. Um, but then I went back down into town and I went and I got myself a coffee, opening the little free newspaper, you know, 10 cents newspaper to hear some amazing news on the first page inside the newspaper about, Hung uh, sorry, not Hungarian, Austrian intelligence. And I would like to show you this little article because it blew my mind. Okay. And uh, hang on, let me bring up the actual image. Okay. So, um, the newspaper thing I found, this is big news, guys, big news. By the way, the newspaper itself, uh, where, is it, where, is it, where is it? Here. The news was state security is, is um, rebuilding itself new, completely new. And it says, well, I, I actually, I just skimmed this, okay? And apparently there was some sort of razzia, some sort of like police, uh, you know, swarming and so on and so on. And they uncovered some really mysterious stuff. I still have to find out the background. But uh, basically they suspended the director of secret services, otherwise known as state protection in Austria. And um, then they uncovered a lot of stuff that seemed to have ruffled feathers so very, very much 
that they thought, oh, I think we need to rebuild Austrian intelligence ground up. Now, this is pretty big news because I kind of, from a systems analysis point of view, when I, when I heard that uh, China executed the head of Intel, I still don't know if that's good news or bad news because the cartel is everywhere. But, you know, it's a step in the right direction. May I say that? You know, so, um, yeah, I think we need a bit more of that you know, by legal means, of course, you know, based on the common law. Um, but now that I hear, oh, in 2018, the Austrians have woken up and thought, hang on, something tells us we need to rebuild Intel ground up. Oh, yeah, you do. Because on the way there, you know, a month before this article, I was machine gunned to smithereens by your Austrian Intel, you know, and on the way back, and this is what really shocked me, you know, in a good way, as soon as I left Hungary and I was on the Austrian motorway, it was just like, you know, a bit of people accessing my head chips, which is normal these days. But I didn't. I wasn't machine gunned. I wasn't passing out. It was wonderful. I had a lovely, lovely day. You know, I thought, what, what happened? And I think what happened is that Intel is being dismantled in Austria and suddenly peace and quiet almost returns. Oh, divine. I wish that would happen over here. Take them all out, please, somebody. <laughs> Exactly. But what I'm trying to say is it can happen because a month ago I would have never thought. But yes, it's in the works. People are fed up about this. And, and you know what? You just have to remind people that and also judges, you know, um, yeah, people can chip me and it's fun, you know, raping and torturing me and all that from your mobile phone. It's a great business plan. But it's even more fun to rape and torture the daughters of a Supreme Court judge. Hmm. Isn't mm -hmm. that a better business plan? How much money is in that? How much ransom money is in that? And so on and so on. And, you know, they, they get paid a lot more than me who earns nothing. So, you know, the really big bucks are in raping, chipping and torturing, you know, the, the, the VIPs and their, their children. And there's evidence for that everywhere, you know. So I think yeah, maybe... If the, when, when are the when VIPs are going to fight back? back? I think they already are. It's just silent. It's just, it's just silent. And, and then this is what really sh what came on to me. By the way, this whole thing, by this article, I, this is another little thing that I need to point out, was in a, in a news, I mean, here you can't see it on this uh, screenshot, uh, this one here. It is um, actually a news, a, a publication called The Crown in Austria. Hang on, where's the little crown? Here. It's page two of the Crown local magazine. And I discovered that Austria seems to be very fond of the Crown. There's, you know, cartel signaling restaurants, very rich ones typically with the Crown, called the Crown. They also have got Crown Hits Radio, you know, um, that was announcing as I was traveling through Austria that they're going into all the schools. So it seems like the Crown Corporation is trying to get its hands on the children in Austria. You know, people should wake up to what the crown hit radio is broadcasting, perhaps, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, the crown is present. But then again, you know, uh, what I'm saying, guys, I'm not saying this is all good because the crown corporation might want to flip Austrian Intel out of its joints and then, you know, come back with its own crown agents. But as long as stuff is in movement, we can get in, you know. So what I'm saying is maybe I only got to know about this yesterday. Maybe now's the time to when this uh, the short affidavit template is finished to restart the tsunami email campaign and maybe notify all the Austrian officials about these crimes going on. And when they are getting upset about, I don't know what they got upset about, they should maybe also really get upset about this. You know, I rather suspect that behind the scenes, this is what they're getting upset about, but they're not allowed to say it publicly. That's what I suspect. I I also think it's very important at this point in time and at this point in history to really move forward on the banning of these weapons, you know, the model statute initiative that Alfred Weber has come up with and that, you know, we can all participate in as, you know, I did question, you know, he called me the Massachusetts state convener and I'm happy to accept a title. Uh, God knows I don't have many of my own. So sure, if somebody wants to give me one. But <laughs> oh, GIT investigator. You're a press officer. <laughs> I'm also G GID press officer. That's right. I do have another title. So, um, but you know, you, you know how I go around calling myself. All right, all right, Ramona. I hear you. I will be the vice president 
I'll say presidents <laughs> of the day. Companies have all these like millions of vice presidents. All right, all right. Let's just have a, you know, after the show, unanimous vote that you're the vice president. We'd all have to be vice presidents then, because, you know, I do believe in fairness and being on the same footing with everybody. So... <laughs> You know, McKinsey and the Boston Consulting Group, they've got like the vice president of bug rolls. I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. But, you know, Alfred assured me that he would be considering me a natural person and a free person for, you know, on the land uh, for the state of Massachusetts rather than MA zip code under US Inc. So, you know, that's what reassured me that, okay, please don't consider me a corporate slave or a US citizen, although that's what my passport states. But I claim freedom, you know, as an American state citizen, as a Virginian state citizen currently domiciled or uh, hanging out in Massachusetts. <laughs> so I have no desire to be considered a number on their slave payroll. So, you know, I very frequently speak about this and I've started to openly write and speak about this because I think it's important at this point in time to withdraw consent from the tyranny on all fronts at all times. If the U.S. government is a slave gov government running a slave corporation and holding on to, what is it, 300 million people in the U.S., considering them all slaves, I'm sorry, I'm going to state I'm certainly not a part of this lunacy. You know, and I think every American with a spine will agree with me, actually. You know, I think every single American on the ground in America will state freely to the U.S. Inc. Corporation that, you know, we aren't really corporate slaves. We happen to be free people and we think of ourselves as free people with freedom of speech, which we are going to exercise. And on the grounds in our neighborhoods, you know, we have to remind people, if you don't exercise your freedoms, you've got a behemoth over here striving to steamroll and take them away from you. So get started acting like you have a spine of your own, a voice of your own, a will of your own, and freedoms of speech and you know all of the other freedoms we are guaranteed under the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and just as being born, you know, their natural born rights, right? That's what I see them as. You know, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get, get born on this planet as a slave, um, I was born as a free being, just as you were, and just as every one of us were. And that being said, I have to say, looking at the time, I have to take off and stop talking. So, Karen, if you have any last words, this might be the time. Okay. Well, I'll add a little bit to that, saying there's nobody's DNA that says slave, period. All right? Because what the United States did was basically codify God's law. He created everybody equal. And what we do with that equality is up to us. All right. Now, um, one of the ladies who watches Techno Crime Fighters, she reminded, I love quotes, and she reminded me of this one uh, from Martin Luther King. Perhaps the worst sin in life is knowing right and not doing it. All right. Well, that goes very much with Ephesians 5, 11 to 12. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. The Bible doesn't say go run off and just don't partake, just go hide. It says expose them. You have an obligation to expose evil. And if you're one of those invertebrates who was fooled into becoming a gang stalker or participating in any of this, you are in the wrong. You are not only in the wrong from some of the greatest philosophers who have ever lived, but you're in the wrong from the most astonishing book ever compiled, which is the Bible, which according to archaeological uh, criteria shouldn't even exist, much less mesh perfectly over a period of 2,000 years. Okay, there is something remarkable about that, about that book, whether you admit it or not. But again, if you don't start to expose it, then you are just as much in the wrong as those people committing these crimes. Would you let your neighbor be raped by somebody who you know who the perpetrator was, but she didn't, but you're just gonna keep quiet? No, because that makes you not only as guilty as he is, but in my book, it makes you worse. So people have got to find their spines, and that's why I call them invertebrates, all right? They've got to find their spine, because I will tell you right now, you're not an American, all right? 
if you don't stand up to this, you're certainly much less than what your heritage has given you and you're throwing it away because that's what the founding fathers were. They were brave and they basically said, we pr pledge our lives and our fortunes to each other because they knew some of them would be utterly destroyed by the revolution, but they did it anyway because they had their children and their children's children to think about, and if not their children, then their neighbors. And we, if we're a country, we're a community. And if we're not a country, then we're vying tribal uh, forces. And this is not a country. This is a killing ground. So you make up your minds, people, okay? Show this to anybody who thinks that they're uh, some kind of patriot by secretly attacking their neighbor. I mean, Deut Deuteronomy 27, 24, 25 deals with that too. Because God says, if you, if you attack your neighbor secretly, or if you're paid to attack him secretly, you are cursed. Right? This is not a patriotic act whatsoever. So, you know, tell your perps, wake up. And, if, and show them this. Because they're not doing right. They're not. And, and that's it for me. Yes, and I would like to finish by tying into that exactly, um, because what the Bible um, says, and I think a lot, I have to, I have to read it in detail, but I think a lot of the, um, the, the good, good things in the Bible actually tally with principles from system physics of what you have to do to actually keep the system alive and healthy and so on. Um, so there's absolutely common ground. And at the end of the day, the laws of physics, if you want to say, are the laws of God, the ultimate laws of God. No one actually breaks them, you know, which is why there's not so much, so many, you know, legal cases about people breaking the laws of physics. Um, but ultimately, this battle is exactly about that. And it's an ancient battle. Um, it's an ancient because this global crime cartel has never Never been shut down and I think the reason why it hasn't been shut down is because we have never come together globally really glo they are global they meaning the criminals and these intelligence agencies but we are not and we have to become global okay and what we are fighting globally we all have to realize is that if you're in Iraq and you lost your family because these psychopathic Nazi nutters including MI6 have killed you and your family or, you know, your family members, you were killed by the Crown Corporation. When I'm being stalked in Oxford, right, whoever the Supreme Court judge is who just has to build himself a control file, I'm being stalked by the mechanism of the Crown Corporation, which is the same that had people flee to the US because they couldn't handle this, by the way, the same thing in, in the Masonic world. I think it's called the white glove treatment. Someone once informed me. So it's all the same. And ultimately, I want to finish with um, this image that I took of the gates of, um, you know, uh, St. Stephen's Basilica in Hungary. This is the image that meets you, right, when you walk up the steps. And as I said, I think if you look carefully, what you'll find is an image of Satan with the horns. It's actually striking when you walk up. Um, this, because the lighting is just perfect, because the, the way the sun falls onto this will give you the impression you're looking at somebody with horns growling at you, absolutely growling, you know, but ultimately he's surrounded by crawling snakes as well, you know, here again. Interestingly, um, Catherine, that looks like an old man who's bearded with a Roman nose and horns. <laughs> Interestingly enough, but um, just to echo that, absolutely, I think, you know, we do need to globally understand that we need to, you know, oust the crime cartel out of our societies, we need to make a stand, we need to stop being invertebrates, as Karen rightfully pointed out, and we need to start understanding that literally we are fighting for our lives as humanity on this planet. Because the future is AI singularity, the internet of things, internet takeover, 5G destruction of everything alive and living, and uh, complete uh, decimation and genocide. And, um, you know, robotization, transhumanizing, etc. That is the future. People do need to wake up. If you don't know it, we know it. We've been reading, we've been watching videos, we've been analyzing info. We do know it. This is the future as the crime cartel envisions it. And therefore, if you believe in a better future for your children and your grandchildren, now is the time to step forward, find your spines, 
find your voice and start speaking out and start saying no to this crime cartel because you know i think ultimately if all of us did that it might become very very simple this cartel will crumble and disappear and dissolve and that indeed is my hope uh for the future that you know we are able to beat them back and to stop them because we don't stop them there's no future for any of us there's no life ahead for any of us we have to stop them yeah. And we will stop them this year. So last sentence I want to throw in, I'm looking for translators for the um, affidavit template. So people of the world, if you speak another language, you know, I will talk about it next time. But, you know, maybe bookmark some free time where you could perhaps, you know, translate it to your language. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.